Never in the history of Dimchurch Rookery had the black-robed inmates such cause to fear the snapping of their fighting tops as during the soul-shaking tempest that swept the English Channel on a November night in 1775. The giant elms groaned, while throughout the village chimney pots crashed down. It was braving death to go out on such a night, but two men were about to attempt it. They had been regaling their spirits in the company of Mr. and Mrs. Waggetts, the proprietors of the ship inn, when they heard the guns. The ship was in distress. Simultaneously, both men had risen. You're not going out, protested Mrs. Waggetts. There's no call for Mary to, but I must, if a ship's coming ashore, said the preventative officer. By reason of his trade, he knew that no throat in Dimchurch was in such constant danger of being cut as his. He also knew that no one was more likely to cut it than his drinking companion. This Merry belied his name. He was sullen and intractable. The ill-assorted companions made their way to a path that runs below the sea wall. Up this path they struggled till they reached the sea wall tavern. At an upstairs window, in the light of a candle, a young woman was peering out. Behind her loomed the figure of her husband. Ahoy there, Abel Clowder! shouted the preventative officer. There was a flash of lightning. Abel left the window, and in a few seconds he had let the two men inside. There's a ship in distress, said the preventative man. Do you know her? Abel shook his head. Come upstairs and have a look. Mrs. Meg Clowder was sitting on the bed as the men came in. Her husband and the preventative man went to the window and waited for the next flash. Mary stood by the door and turned his cadaverous eyes upon the girl's clear-cut, almost classic features. Her brown hair that fell upon her firm young breast somehow stirred his blood. As the lightning flashed again, he saw what the others had been watching, a sturdy brig with broken masts being hurled nearer and nearer to the sea wall. She'll be broken up within the groin, said Abel. By gad, she's on fire too. Oh, poor people, murmured Meg. Can we do nothing but watch? Can't launch a boat, replied her husband, but a line might help him. If she comes nearer, I'll risk it. No, Abel, Meg cried. It is madness. Mrs. Clowder, that ain't no sea to swim in, I allow, said the preventative officer. But there's two men on Romney Marsh that might attempt it. Your man and the young vicar. Why, there's Parson Bolden now exclaimed Abel. Where? said Mary, going to the window. He had a purpose. He dropped his scarf on the floorboards. On the lee side of the boathouse, was the answer to Mary's question. There's already a crowd of lads. Then it's time we joined them, said Abel. The preventative man made for the staircase. Mary followed, but one look he shot as he went, and he saw Meg in her husband's arms, and he hugged his hatred to his soul. When Abel came down, Mary put his hand to his collar. I've dropped my scarf. He was up the stairs before Abel realised he was going. Meg sat with her face buried in her arms. Feeling a hand rumpling her hair, she imagined her husband had returned, but she looked up at Mary. What do you want? Meg stood up, taking the candle. My scarf, he muttered, picking it up. And should anything happen to him? He jerked his head towards the stairs. I shall be here to take charge of you, see? As he spoke, his fingers extinguished the flame of the candle, plunging the room into darkness. Before she could cry out, Meg's head was clenched in the crook of his arm and she was suffocated against the wetness of his coat. Come on, man! cried Abel. Meg freed herself and as the lightning flashed again, she was alone. The three men made their way to the fast-gathering group under the shadow of the boathouse. They were joined by the parson. He agreed that it would be impossible to launch a boat, but he thought that a couple of strong swimmers might reach the wreck with a rope, and he maintained he was willing to attempt it. Abel said he would join him, and ropes were brought from the boathouse. Both men accordingly stripped off their coats and boots and buckled on their life preservers. Then the two heroes climbed the sea wall, and plunging in, were swept out to meet the incoming seas. Meanwhile, the news of the wreck had reached the courthouse, so the helpers on the rope were augmented by the squire and Dr. Sennacherib Pepper, the local physician. With these extra hands, 
it was easy for Merry to move away. While his colleagues were busy over the living, he decided to get busy with the dead that might soon be floating ashore. Then, up and right above the sea wall line rose the waters, carrying the ship onwards. The thunder cracked, but not even that could drown the great thud as the ship's bows cut into dim church wall like a battering ram. Meg was at the window, and she clapped her hands over her eyes. During the destructive seconds of the storm's ferocity that followed, she felt the house shake violently, and then the casement crashed inwards, its heavy leadwork striking her on the head. How long Meg lay under the pile of twisted lead and glass she could not tell, for the injury had left her senseless. When she roused herself, the violence of the storm had gone, but had left behind its own terror. As she looked through the space where the window had been, she saw the enormous head of a wooden-looking giant leaning over the broken sea wall. She heard voices and the tramp of men's feet. She was powerless to move, but she knew they were carrying her Abel away, and she guessed he was dead. Wait while I break the news to his wife, she heard the squire say. And after the noise of wood being cleared, she heard him coming up the stairs. My poor Meg, I've got the worst possible news. But I already know, Sir Tony. He told me. Look, he's staring at me. It's the devil. Don't let him get me, squire. Meg, it's no devil, the squire answered calmly. It's nothing but the wooden figurehead of the broken brig city of London. Your heroic husband and our no less valiant vicar had almost reached it with a lifeline when a great tidal wave lifted the ship above them. It is some comfort to know that their death was quick. Come, Meg, let me take you to the courthouse. Meg took two steps towards him and then, turning, looked once more at the figurehead. Then, with a pathetic moan, she collapsed into the squire's arms. Meanwhile, Mary left the shelter of the seawall and approached a body lying face downwards on the beach. The ghoulish wretch perceived at once that the man was dressed as a sailor of rank and his fingers were clasped around an oilskin package. Mary wrenched it from him and ripped open the waterproof case but found it was of no value to him, though the greatest import to a conscientious captain, for it was the logbook. Mary dragged the body up the stones beneath the shadow of the wall. He then turned it on its back, and in doing so heard the chink of gold. With greedy fingers he unbuttoned the sea coat and found a waist belt. Fumbling with the buckle, the corpse of the captain, to his utter astonishment, opened his eyes. The captain was alive, and looked a man of iron. It was no time to hesitate. Merry flashed his knife out of his pocket and drove it into the captain's heart. Then he dragged the heavy belt from the corpse and fastened it beneath his coat. As he straightened, he saw to his delight another body. He approached with caution. The body lay on its side, dressed in a suit of sombre black. Despite the rough passage, this survivor had managed to keep on his shoes and imposing three-cornered hat. A rope fastened round his wrist trailed into the water. With his left hand grasping his knife, Mary's right explored his second victim. This one also had a money belt. He resolved to stab this corpse as he had stabbed the other and then lock them arm in arm as though they had fought. He thereupon drew out his knife and glanced over his shoulder to make sure he was not being observed. That movement was his undoing, for as he turned his head he received a violent crack over the skull. When he recovered, he was lying on his back, while his intended victim was sitting on his chest and grinning at his discomfort. Say so you've decided not to rid the world of yourself as well as of the captain, eh? The survivor produced a silver flask and tilted brandy down his throat. No doubt you could do with a drop yourself. Mary could, and moved his hand but saw that his wrists were tied with rope that disappeared into the fast receding waves. What's the idea? You ask me what is the idea, said his captor. I'll tell you. To stick a knife in a helpless man as you did to that unfortunate captain merely to steal a belt of money which is now around my waist. No, my friend, 
and by God, unless you comply with my terms... What terms? growled Mary. First of all, obedience. What's your name? Mary. Your name belies you, then. Occupation? I do odd jobs. Very odd jobs, it seems. Where do you live? Here in Dimchurch. I lived here all my life. And what's more, you'll go on living here. All your life, retorted the stranger. Until such time as it pleases me to send you to the gallows for this night's murder. And I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, Mr. Merry Murderer. So I shall keep a weather eye on you. Now, tell me. Does a cob tree still rule at the courthouse here? Oi, Sir Anthony Cobtree. Then Sir Charles is dead. Broke his neck after the fox he did, ten or more years ago. Well, with all respect to the late squire, I rejoice to learn that my old friend Tony is now the king's authority upon the marsh. Now, on your feet. The stranger pulled the rope attached to Mary's wrists. Here's my sea chest on the end of this cord. When it's safe at the courthouse, I'll expend one of the captain's guineas on you. Mary got to his feet and followed his new master across the beach. He was thinking quickly now. Never would he be safe while this stranger lived. No one else knew of his safe landing. The stranger dead, Mary would retrieve the captain's guineas as well as the stranger's money belt. Such a chance was a gift from the devil himself, and he must take it. The stranger had taken his knife, but the devil showed him a handier weapon. This was a broken piece of breakwater studded with bolts. He picked it up quickly. The moment was ripe, for the stranger was engrossed in the sea chest. Mary approached behind his back slowly and stealthily. Gripping the iron-loaded billet, he swung it up when the stranger whipped round like lightning and the astonished Mary was being driven back with a long blade pricking into his chest. Drop that, you dog, or I'll drive this knife through you. Mary dropped the weapon and retreated, gibbering with fear. I seem destined to upset your plans, Mr. Mary. Now the chest, if you please. Mary strode off into the water. As he stooped to upend the chest, a wave broke over his shoulders. This discomfort irritated Mary beyond all. He would show the stranger that he was a man to be feared for his strength, and with a superhuman effort fed by rage and wounded pride, he somehow got the breaking weight upon his back and staggered from the water. Splendid! cried the stranger. And when I have a knife in your shoulder blades, I'll say splendid too, thought Mary. Aloud, he grunted, To the courthouse, you said? I did. As they approached the steps cut in the sea wall, the stranger stopped and regarded the captain's body. Best thing's to give him a sea burial, eh? said Mary. No, we'll lay him to rest in the churchyard. But the wound? Now... If you, being a survivor, could say that some sort of panic took place on board the ship... The stranger silenced Mary with a gesture. A seagull hovering overhead then caused him to lay his handkerchief over the face. He removed his hat and with bowed head uttered a prayer. Then, signing to Mary to proceed, he fell in at his side. As to what will be thought of the captain's death wound, I cannot say, Mr. Mary, but you can be sure of this. Cross me but once, and I shall denounce you for tonight's murder. The church bells were pealing out their danger summons to the marsh, and the stranger and Mary had not heard the ringing of the courthouse bell. But as they crunched their way across the gravel to the front door, they saw another man being admitted. The footman was closing the door when the stranger called to him. I wish to see Sir Antony. And then, without waiting for the footman's reply, he turned to Mary and added, Put my chest in here. The young footman was taken aback by the stranger's unexpected entrance and air of command. The High Lord of the Level is at present engaged with several local gentlemen, sir. A villager has just arrived with grave news. 
No doubt he would see you in the morning if your business be urgent. Urgent? It would seem so, I think, in that I have successfully negotiated fire and tempest and swum from the wreck to transact it. Oh, if you are a survivor, sir, my lord will see you immediately, for such were his orders, though he had small hope that any could live. Then the grave news you spoke of was that no survivor had reached land, eh? Worse than that, sir. The body of our vicar has been recovered. The vicar of Dimchurch is dead? Aye, sir. Parson Bolden swam out with a lifeline with young Clowder. Both lost. The young widow Clowder has been brought here. Going on something shocking till Dr. Pepper gave her something to quiet her. Poor lass, said the stranger. He took a guinea from the captain's belt. And now, my young friend, be good enough to carry this coin to the man Mary there. Oh, and untie his wrists. A guinea, sir? For a porter's fee? A shilling? Give him the guinea. The chest is heavy. I will give you the same if you carry it up to my bedroom here later. And then, with a cheery good night from the stranger, Mary was shown the door. As the wretch clutched the money, he was reminded again of what he had missed. He should by now have been a rich man, and then Meg would have been his for the asking. His blood racing in red rage, he vowed to find the means of settling scores with the mysterious stranger. Cudgelling his brain how best to accomplish this, he made his way back to the scene of the crime. A glance showed him that so far the corpse had not been discovered. The white silk handkerchief had preserved the face from the greedy seagulls. And then Mary noticed a name on the corner. He ripped the kerchief quickly from the dead man's face and read by the light of the moon. Yes, beautifully worked in violet silk thread, a large D and a small R. That, he knew, stood short for Doctor. There followed a capital S, a Y, and an N. Dr. Sin. And just as the murderer spelt out the name, the footman in the hall said, What name shall I say, sir? Sin. Dr. Sin. Around the great fireplace in the dining room, the squire and some gentlemen of the marsh were discussing the parson's death. Have you anyone in mind to appoint in poor Bolden's place? asked Dr. Pepper. There's only one man I can think of, but whether he is dead or alive, God alone knows. It was an understood thing that he should become vicar of Dimchurch, for he loved the place as we all loved him. He used to stay here during the Oxford vacations. I recollect him, said Dr. Pepper. A brilliant young man. I should think he was, agreed the squire, turning to a bookcase at the side of the chimney. He drew out a volume which he opened at the title leaf. A solemn discourse on religious assemblies and the public service of God. It's beyond me, but the book made such an impression upon Oxford that the university, despite his youth, conferred on him the title of Doctor of Divinity. What happened to him then? asked another of the party. He went to America under depressing circumstances. It's believed he was killed by Indians, for after much inquiry I learnt he went amongst them on a mission and has never been heard of since. What was his name? Dr. Sin, announced the voice of the footman. The squire spun round as though he had been shot. No one moved, for concentration was riveted on this tall, slim stranger who stood in the dark doorway. The gentleman seems to be the only survivor of the wreck, sir, and consequently must ask your indulgence, gentlemen, for his appearance, added the stranger. That he was still a stranger to the squire was obvious, for all he did was stare and mutter. No. No. Impossible. I hardly expected you to recognise me immediately, went on the stranger. We've many years to span, and a hard life alters most men. The last time I was here, I asked your father to accept a book of mine. We were but now admiring it, sir, said Sennacherib Pepper. He passed it to the author. He, in turn, looked at the title page with a grim smile. My faith, I must have been in a solemn mood when I penned this. God, the squire thundered, crashing his fist on the table. 
I see him now, my old friend Christopher Sin, mercifully restored. My dear friend, welcome home. In a few minutes the whole house appeared to be alive with people hurrying about on various errands. By the time Dr. Sin had been taken to a comfortable bedroom, had been arrayed in a dry shirt and breeches of the squires, and had been presented to the Cobtree family, a magnificent cold supper was awaiting him in the dining room, where he did full justice to a game pie and a bottle of claret. Maintaining that his own story could wait, Dr. Sin wanted to know all the news of the village, merely satisfying their curiosity about his own doings by telling them he had been in America preaching the gospel to the Indians. And none of your experiences could be stranger than the shipwreck, said the squire. There we were, talking of you, and in you walk. Seems like fate. Charlotte, the eldest of the squire's three daughters, nodded. She was a beautiful blonde of twenty. She felt a strange thrill in the presence of this newcomer. Yes, she thought, here is a man a sad, lonely man of whom any woman in the world would feel proud. Dr. Sin read the look upon her guileless face, an admiration innocent enough but yet a warning to him, and it was this look that influenced him that very night to take a certain course. But this was after the household returned to quiet after the storm. The physician had left his patient, Meg Clowder, in Lady Cogtree's care, and she had arranged to share the watches with Charlotte and the housekeeper. The squire carried Dr. Sin's candles to his room. It's strange, too, that the servants got ready this room. He pointed to the dead parson's wig and gown. He brought the wig to have it dressed, I suppose. But why did he bring the Geneva gown? He tore it on the chancel rail, Papa. I have mended it. They turned and saw Charlotte standing in the doorway with a black coat over her arm. And what are you doing here, miss? I've been mending the sleeve of Dr. Sin's coat. I noticed it was torn when they were drying it. That's very kind of you, said the doctor, examining the sleeve. And it's beautifully done. I have had to learn to work with a needle myself out of necessity, so I know. So you're already mothering the doctor, are you, miss? This had been a joke with the squire over the young parson. Off to bed. Good night, Tony's daughter, said Dr. Sin. He smiled and kissed her on the cheek. Good night, little mother. Charlotte blushed, and with a hurried curtsy rushed away. The squire went off to his room and did not notice that the outer door of Dr. Sin's powder closet was open, and as for the doctor, he never gave it a thought as he started to unpack his sea chest. It was packed tightly with various compartments, and everything was wrapped in oilskin. Carefully covered with a velvet pad and lying in a tray was a pair of silver-hilted long swords. In a corner, a case of pistols. His books, a brass telescope, and a sextant had their own compartments, and when these had been removed, there was a tray of clothes. In the lower compartments were bags of coins and a heavy package. He weighed it lovingly in his hands, but he did not remove the red flannel that was wrapped around it. In shape, it resembled a long brick, but was vastly heavier. Dr. Sin stood and surveyed his property, and his face bore a look of infinite satisfaction. His next employment was to examine the Geneva gown. He slipped it over his head. By the open door of the powder closet there stood a tall pier glass. Holding the lighted candle, he surveyed his pale face and raven locks that fell on the shoulders of the gown, and he shook his head. No, it won't do, my friend. It's the hair. It suits the face too well. It gives a romantic environment to the owner. Tony's girl, Charlotte, gave me a warning of it, for the sweet girl had not the skill to disguise her thoughts. My degree will raise me dangerously enough above my fellow vicars, therefore I must tone myself down. If I am to lie low here, I must not be too conspicuous. Above all, there must be no women to play Delilah to my Samson. My secrets are too dangerous. From the chest he took a pair of scissors and cut short the rebellious hair. Then he found his dark-tinted spectacles he had used in the tropics and pushed them on his nose. 
Once more he regarded himself in the mirror and was so elated by what he saw that he took a deep pull at his silver brandy flask. He then discarded the gown and began to dress himself in a fine suit of scarlet velvet trimmed with silver braid. He pulled on elegant thigh boots and attached his sword. Into his hat he clipped an ostrich feather, and then he approached the glass and favoured his magnificent reflection with a bow. Just then the stable clock struck three. Captain Clegg, he whispered, I regret to inform you that we have reached the parting of the waves. If I do not discontinue your company, it is as like as not that I should accompany you to execution dock. Let me in parting present you to your successor, Dr. Sin, D.D. of Oxford University and Vicar of Dimchurch under the wall. Drawing his sword, he picked up gown and wig upon the point and made them bob up and down before the mirror. The same three strokes of the stable clock woke Charlotte, and she crept along the gallery to relieve her mother at Meg's bedside. She saw the open door of the powder closet and went to close it, but she stopped in terror, for there, reflected in a most unearthly light, she saw a vision of her father's guest. She had heard tales of ghostly visitants, and there was nothing real about this figure. In the flickering light it resembled the man she so admired in feature, but the clothes were those of a swaggering gallant. But why should a living man appear to her? It was then that she saw the dead one. A second form seemed to be dancing beside him, and she recognised the wig and black gown of the dead parson. In sheer panic, Charlotte fled along the gallery. Hearing a noise, Dr. Sin quickly divested himself of his hat and coat. The door to the landing was wide open. There was no one there, but his eye caught something white upon the carpet. It was a small lace handkerchief. He picked it up, and the faint odour of roses which it held rolled back the years, and he felt young again, romantic and in love. He went back to his room and began stowing all his property back into the chest. Then he took himself and the lace handkerchief to the sanctuary of the great four-poster bed. There, holding the handkerchief close to his face, in the hope that its gentle fragrance might breathe into his sleep sweet dreams of long-forgotten innocence, and thanking God for bringing him home again, he fell asleep. The next thing Dr. Sin knew was the stable clock striking eight. He swung out of bed and crossed to the window. There, across the red roofs, rose the sharp green bank of the sea wall upon which a party of men were repairing the storm damage. He repeated to himself the slogan of the marsh, Serve God, honour the king, but first maintain the wall. A door beneath him opened and Charlotte appeared, dressed in a green velvet riding habit. Looking up, she saw the doctor in his ludicrous nightcap and shirt and smiled. You'll catch your death of cold. I'll send the footman up with some hot chocolate. Oh, and if you'd like him to shave you, father says he's not met a barber to equal Robert anywhere. Then I'll save myself the bother of cutting my own throat. She laughed, but not at his facetious remark. So you have it. I must have dropped it in your room. What? Why, my lace handkerchief that you're holding, she replied pointing to his hand. Up to that moment, Dr. Sin had been unaware that he'd been doing any such thing. He now realised he must have clutched it all night. Drop it down, she called. If I were twenty, nay, ten years younger, Miss Charlotte, I should not think of giving up this kerchief. Catch. He dropped it and she caught it, giving him a curtsy of thanks. I hear you're an expert with the razor, Robert. Dr. Sin said when the footman bought the cocoa. I wore my hair long in America, but in England it is meet and right that I should wear the orthodox badge of my calling, a parson's wig. So please shave and polish my skull, Robert, and I'll be ready for breakfast. But, sir, you'll put on a great many years. My good Robert, that is just what I require. When Dr. Sin entered the dining room, he found Charlotte and her sisters in possession. Good morning, young ladies. They turned and stared at him in amazement. Have I changed then so much? Utterly!
utterly, exclaimed Cicely. And grown older? Years, replied Maria. Dear, dear, how distressing, Dr. Sin sighed. And what does Miss Charlotte think? That my sisters are being very personal, she answered, smiling. Dr. Sin was saved from further attack by the arrival of Lady Cobtree and the squire. They were discussing the seawall tavern. I hear the place is uninhabitable, said Lady Cobtree. Tell Meg I shall make it my business to see that the house is restored, said the squire. Josiah Rate, master builder to the Lords of the Level, was put in charge. It was his suggestion that wood from the wrecked brig should be used for the rebuilding. Within a few days, Meg was well enough to venture out, escorted by Charlotte and the parson, to view the work of restoration. It was Josiah's boast that every piece of usable wood from the brig had been utilised. "'Aye, Meg, there's more City of London than Sea Wall Tavern,' he told her. "'The squire believes the house should stand as a memorial to your husband and Parson Bolden, Meg,' explained Dr. Sin. "'And as he is giving you a new licence, now would be the time to change the title from Sea Wall Tavern to the City of London.' "'And what tavern has a finer sign than that, Meg, eh?' Meg shuddered as she saw Josiah patting the wooden face of the brig's figurehead. Oh, no, just the words on the wall, please. The builder was disappointed, but Dr. Sin had an idea. You build boats, I hear, in your timber shed, Mr. Rate. What if you set this figurehead high on your work barn as a sign of your trade? Josiah was more than happy at the suggestion and had the figurehead immediately removed. On the day of his installation, Dr. Sin left the courthouse and took up his quarters in the vicarage. It is a wrench leaving you, my good Tony, although it is but for a matter of a few yards. Well, I make it a condition that you dine with us every Sunday, said the squire. Oh, by the way, you've done wonders with that rascal Mary. Dr. Sin smiled. He seemed to find quite a pleasure in obeying me. But Mary did not obey in all things. For one day he went all the way to Rye and purchased there a knife, a long, sharp knife. And every day he went to work, he watched Dr. Sin out of the corner of his eye and thought to cheer himself up when he was being more than servile of the knife's sharpness. As the months went by, Sir Anthony Cobdry realised with growing satisfaction that he would never regret the bestowal of his vicarage upon Dr. Sin, his only fear was that by virtue of his old friend's learning he would be tempted to accept some high preferment, and to counteract any such calamity he got his favourite the honourable appointment of Dean of the Peculiars. Under such patronage most men would have felt secure against the past, but Dr. Sin always kept watch over his own restless spirit. Perhaps his hardest task in the part he had set himself to play was forcing himself to an indifference where Charlotte Cobtree was concerned. All the time there was Charlotte running in and out of the vicarage on this errand and that, and at each visit Dr. Sin suffered more and more from the longing that she would stay with him for good. And then, on a bright spring morning, Mr. Mipps came trundling along by the churchyard, pushing his sea chest on a barrow. He sat down on the low wall and smoked his pipe. Looking around, he saw standing on the sea wall the black-garbed figure of Dr. Sin. Mr. Mipps, becoming strangely nervous of a sudden, vaulted over the churchyard wall. He heard his master's footsteps crunching over the gravel. Then they stopped. Mipps. His chest. Dr. Sin read quietly. Come out and let's have a look at you. All aboard, sir, replied Mipps, jumping up and saluting. And what do you want with me? Well, sir, knowing as how you wish to settle down at your first profession and hearing as how a gentleman answering to your description was beneficed here in my birthplace, I thought, sir, that you might be glad of a grateful old ship's carpenter who wants to settle down too. And what if I prefer to forget the past, eh? A fierceness had flashed into Dr. Sin's eyes. What if I deny having seen you before? What then? What then, sir? repeated Mipps, swallowing his disappointment with an effort. Why, no offence took, sir, and I'll steer for an anchorage elsewhere. 
Good morning, sir. And vaulting into the road, he picked up the barrow shafts and started back the way he had come. As Dr. Sin watched the little sea dog setting off without a grumble, his eyes grew kind. Come back, you rascal. Round came the barrow and back came Mips. I'll find you the means of settling down, said Dr. Sin. But remember this. I have never seen you before in my life. Got that? Got it, sir. And what's in the chest, my good Mips? The gold bar? Mips shook his head. No, Captain. Don't call me Captain. Vicar. Yes, Vicar. No, Vicar. The gold bar got turned into guineas, and the guineas sort of disappeared. Dr. Sin smiled. Suppose I give you a snug berth here as parish sexton. Can you keep your mouth shut? Can you forget that I was anything other than Parson Sin? Mips held up his right hand. I solemnly forgets. Digging graves now, Dr. Sin said casually. You can manage that. I've dug one or two in my time, sir. And quickly... Now you remember when you... No, Mr. Mips, I do not remember, Dr. Sin said sharply. And as a carpenter, you can make coffins? No one couldn't knock up a coffin quicker. Or solider. Very well, Mips. I'll bespeak a cottage for you. There's one available in the village, and next door there's a barn you can use as a workshop. But one more thing. Something else for me to do, sir? No, something you must never do. I warn you, Mr. Sexton, not to traffic in any way with the brandy runners. For that smuggling goes on, I have no doubt. But periodically, government officers show themselves inquisitive. That is the danger always. That is why I am ever exhorting my flock, for whom I feel responsible not to traffic with those devils across the water. Yes, Vicar. But first of all... Just for the sake of old times, come to the vicarage and we'll drink a toast. To our settling down, vicar. To our remembering to forget, said Dr. Sin. Thus, Mr. Mipps became sexton of Dimchurch and general factotum to the vicar. In addition to making coffins, he opened a store where you could buy anything from fishing nets to pickled onions. Mips became generally admired, and in the process learned many things that were so profitable that his conscience was quietened. Although at first intending only to disobey the vicar for just the occasional flutter, the excitement got hold of him, and before long he found himself a leader involved in the smuggling business up to his neck. On one point, Mips was adamant. No firearms were to be carried by his smugglers. But with all his caution disaster came, and from an outside source. A riding officer from Sandgate was murdered on the hills above the marsh. The murderer was brutal and mean-spirited, and if he was brought to trial there was no doubt that he would make others share his fate. His name was Grinsley, and he ran a farm up at Aldington, but his chief source of income was from passing smuggled goods to London. Apparently resenting some harsh treatment at his hands, one of his labourers had reported him to the excise office at Sandgate. An officer was sent to search the farm, but in an uncontrollable rage, Grinsley had discharged a blunderbuss full in his face before disappearing into the woods on his black horse. It did not take the gentlemen of Dimchurch long to realise that Grinsley's death was the best thing that could happen for their own safety, and in an effort to prevent him being taken alive, they seized their weapons and set off upon the trail. Dr. Sin followed the hue and cry, riding towards Aldington on his white pony. On the way, he met Charlotte Cobtree. My father is with the dragoons, she said, drawing rein. I had to come away. The man Grinsley is a scoundrel, but there are now so many against him. I'm afraid this man has little reason to earn your sympathy, my dear Charlotte, the doctor smiled sadly. I sometimes believe that whatever I had done or were to do, you would still treat me with the same sweet kindness. Will you remember you have said that, please? This conversation was interrupted by the captain of the dragoons who had ridden towards them. 
So you have not yet unearthed the fox, said Dr. Sin as the officer drew rein. Not yet, sir. The rascal may already be heading for London. Dr. Sin shook his head. I should first read the signs along that hedge, Captain. It runs from Grinsley's farm to the high road. He dismounted and walked along, peering into the bushes. Then he stopped and picked up a bundle of clothes. The clothes that Grinsley was wearing when he committed the crime, cried the dragoon. But how did you know they were there? I thought it was most probable that Grinsley would get rid of such tell-tale garments when I read the description on your posters, said Dr. Sin. But I didn't expect to find them here till I saw Grinsley's turnip patch. Take a look. The dragoon looked at the turnip field in question, but shook his head. Why, someone has taken the scarecrow's clothes, cried Charlotte. Exactly, laughed Sin. There was an old long black coat and a black three-cornered hat. That was all Grinsley required. He hides his conspicuous clothes in the hedge and puts on the scarecrows. Isn't that convincing, Captain? Convincing enough to alter the murder posters, replied the Captain. Thank you, sir. Miss Cobtree? And he galloped away. That evening, Dr. Sin dined at the courthouse. The squire told him that Lloyds had written asking for the logbook from the wreck of the City of London. He promised to deliver it in the morning. On his return to the vicarage, he saw Mipps. I'd like to have a word with Mary, he said. So the sexton departed in search of Mary, and Dr. Sin poured himself a brandy and settled down to look through the logbook of the ill-fated ship. On the last page, he read with astonishment, This is the last will and testament of me, Mervyn Ransom, master and owner of the brig City of London, who, having no kith and kin, bequeath what I possess to be divided equally amongst all persons voyaging upon the said brig at my death. The brig shall be broken up, and her materials sold, the money divided as stated. I will not risk my brig having another master. The figure alone shall be kept. Let it be taken to some worthy boat-builders, and left there for a memorial. But before carrying this into effect, let my beneficiaries remove the Latin block between the shoulder-blades. It is corked in securely, but in the cavity thus revealed will be found a string of pearls. As a young man I collected them myself, matching them carefully. I kept them for her whom I hoped would marry me on my return, but when I made it home I found she had died. I kept them as a gift to my ship. Perhaps in years to come these pearls will adorn the neck of a beautiful woman. I pray God that her mind is beautiful too, for she for whom they were meant was perfect. Dr. Sin was the sole survivor of the brig. The pearls were his. As he read the extraordinary document again, there came a knocking at the door. Mips said you wanted me, growled Mary. That matter can wait, but you will accompany me to Rate's yard with a lantern. Tell Mips to bring his bag of tools. But it's blowing half a gale. It was blowing a full gale when you murdered the captain. The three men made their way to Rate's yard. We're going to pay our respects to the figurehead of the City of London, the doctor explained. There was little fear of disturbing old Josiah, who lived on the other side of the yard, but Dr. Sin took the precaution of placing Mary there while he and Mips took a ladder and climbed up to the figurehead. Now, Master Carpenter, whispered Dr. Sin, you see that line? I want you to unpick it and quickly. Right, Vicar. Sin held the lantern while Mips uncorked the tight seam of oakum. When he pulled out the loosened block, Sin put his hand into the cavity and drew out a string of pearls. Listen, said Mips. I heard a man gasp. Mary's watching. I intended he should. Dr. Sin dropped the string of pearls into his pocket and the two men descended the ladder. You will accompany us to the vicarage, Mr. Merry, said Dr. Sin as they left the yard. After your wait, you'll no doubt be glad of a drink. On their way back, he called to the stable to say good night to his pony. I have noticed, Mr. Mipps, that periodically my stable door is unlocked. Really, vicar? And every time it has happened, I see a chalked cross above the door. Let us see if it is there now, shall we? He approached the store. There you are, a white cross. What do you make of it? 
I make a good deal, growled Merry. You'll find every stable door open tonight. Not only on the marsh. It means that the party that owns that horse is favoured. I'll go and have a look at some other stables, said Mipps. Not yet, replied Dr. Sin. I want you both in my study for a few minutes. And he led the way to the vicarage. From the corner cupboard in his study, the vicar produced a bottle and glasses. Draw up a chair, Mr. Merry, he said cheerily. Oh, and please take off your coat. I'll keep it on. No, no, it is wet. Having poured out three glasses of brandy, Dr. Sin firmly drew off his sullen guest's coat and placed it close to the fire. Pick up your glasses and drink. Both men did not need a second invitation. But then, seeing that Dr. Sin's hand was in the pocket of the drying coat, Merry slammed down his glass and with an oath took a step towards the vicar. His threatening attitude was arrested by the vicar whipping from the pocket an ugly sharp knife. A very formidable weapon, Mr. Merry. Put this amongst your tools, Mr. Mipps. What right have you to rob me? exploded Merry. The right of a good citizen in defending the next wreck on Dimchurch Wall, my friend. You were told not to provide yourself with a weapon when I robbed you of the knife that committed murder. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Mipps knows all about Captain Ransom's death. I thought it best in case of any accident happening to me. So, replied Mary, I have broken three of your high-handed orders. First, I have approached Meg Clowder, yes, and with an offer of marriage. What though she refuses, she won't always. Secondly, I have carried a knife. And lastly, I have disobeyed you again tonight. I know, said Dr. Sin, with a tolerant smile. You left your post at Josiah Rates, as I knew you would, and you saw me take the pearls from the figurehead. I wanted you to see me do it. Why? asked Mary. I can bring up an unpleasant charge against you if I have any more of your high-handed nonsense. This threat the vicar ignored. Do you know anything about pearls, Mr. Mary? I suppose not. He took the string of pearls from his pocket. Well, these are so good that they could be sold in London for thousands of pounds. I wanted you to realise that had you murdered me as well as the good captain, you would have got away with these as well as my sea chest full of gold. I wouldn't have known about the pearls. Oh, you would, for their hiding place was revealed in the captain's logbook that you threw aside. Well, accuse me of murder if you like, returned Mary but they'll want to know why you kept your mouth shut for so long. And when I tell them about the pearls, they'll be your motive, especially when I say I saw you kill the captain. Mind you, I'm not above coming to terms. Give me the pearls and we'll say no more about it. Why on earth should I do that? Because I want Meg Clowder and any woman would marry the devil himself if he dangled a gift like that in his wooing. So hand him over, Mr. Parson Thief. I take it you can read, Mr. Mary? asked the vicar pleasantly. Oh, I can read, and write, too. Very well. Then read this. No, I cannot allow you to touch it. The evidence is too valuable, and I must show it to the squire before I present those pearls to his daughter. It is her twenty-first birthday tomorrow, Mr. Merry, and I am quite sure that the captain you murdered would approve of my bestowing his legacy in that direction. Perhaps I will read it for you. And so Dr. Sin read to Mary and the delighted Mips every word of Mervyn Ransom's testament. When he had finished, Mary was handed his coat and dismissed while the sexton was detained to drink another glass. You've clipped the vulture's wings tonight, Becker, chuckled Mips. I believe so, replied Dr. Sin. But I'm worried about this business of the stable doors, and I'm sure Mary will do what he can to increase that worry. Keep your eyes open, Mr. Mipps, and let me know about any smuggling going on. When he left the vicarage, Mr. Mipps repaired as fast as his legs would carry him to the ship inn. 
Since the dragoons were known to be up the hills scouring after Grinsley, the ingenious little sexton had seen a wonderful opportunity for a safe run upon the marsh, and a fully loaded lugger was already waiting in the bay. Dr. Sin was thinking about how he would present the pearls to Charlotte. He went to his sea chest and drew out Captain Clegg's red velvet coat. With his scissors, he cut off the two gold-embroidered pocket flaps and sewed them together. He then removed enough gold braid to form the letters C.C. and dropped the pearls into their velvet pocket. His labour of affection had banished all worry about the smugglers. And worry was the last thing that entered Mr. Mipp's head as he saw the kegs being carried ashore from the lugger. But one man did worry. Captain Faunce went from patrol to patrol in the region of Aldington. Not a sign of Grinsley. At Aldington Knoll he climbed the hill with his sergeant. Beneath them stretched the marsh. For some minutes they watched the white vapours of mist rushing along over the flat surface in a windy stampede. See that, sir? said the sergeant. What? A ship. A boat. There again, sir. See, there. Faunce nodded. And there's a boat putting off. Sergeant, what if our man's been hiding on the marsh after all? Come on, let's go. And thus it was that the full regiment of dragoons rode hell for leather across the marsh upon this misty, windy night. In the meantime, Mr. Mipps, now upon the windswept beach, superintending the loading of the horses, saw his dreams of yet another run being successfully terminated. Now, Dr. Sin always slept with his windows open, for he liked to hear the sounds of the sea. On this particular night, he awoke, hearing a noise of someone clambering up the ivy beneath his window. He raised himself on one elbow, and from beneath the bolster drew out a pistol. Perceiving a shadow silhouetted against the driving white clouds, he whispered, If you move, I'll fire. Don't shoot, Captain, because there'll be death enough on the marsh this night. Mips, what are you doing here? Can I come in and explain, Captain? For my back view is an excellent target for any fool's blunderbuss. Come in. Right, sir, I'll tell you, said Mips as he slid into the room. An horrible affair has taken place. I can guess it, hissed Sin. You're involved in the smuggling. Someone had to look after the fools. And you know, Captain, you like to drop a brandy yourself, just as I like a bit of excitement. Well, we was landing kegs on the beach, calm as you please, when down gallops the dragoons looking for Grinsley and collars us all. You too? Yes, but I had my face muffled. Slip my cables in no time and come here for help. Now, Vicar, I take it you ain't going to stand by and see the pick of the parish struck up like mutineers. If there's one man who can't save him, it's you, Captain Clegg. How? Mips realised that Dr. Sin was already searching his mind for a possible way out. Blessed if I know, sir, but the captured men belong to your flock, and the sheep are bleating for the shepherd. You ain't the one to fail him, I know that. There was a long pause. Then suddenly, Mips received the vicar's screwed-up nightcap in his face. The bedclothes were hurled away, and with an emphatic, Damn you! Sin leapt across the room, and from behind a row of books grasped a bottle of French brandy. After taking a long pull, the well-remembered voice of Clegg spoke sharply. From now on, Mr. Sexton, your damned fool sheep shall have a shepherd who will keep his crook about their silly necks, and the excisemen shall dance to the scarecrow's tune. The scarecrow? echoed Mips. That's what I said, you little fool. The scarecrow. Saddle me my white pony, which you and your smugglers can thank God you left behind. And put the panniers aboard. In them you will put the scarecrow's rags, eye, hat and all, and tarred toe wig, and lash em down. Where are those fools captured? Knock Holt Beach, tied hand and foot, sitting on our kegs and surrounded by half of those damned dragoons. Take this key and unlock a bag of guineas that you'll find at the corner of my sea chest. Has Mother Handaway rented her stables to anyone yet? The sexton shook his head. 
It's devilish lonely, and the farmers say she's a witch. Dr. Sin dressed hurriedly, slipped his pistol into his pocket, and went down the stairs. The pony was saddled as he had directed, and he mounted. Then, turning to the sexton, he whispered, If I can draw off the dragoons, you free the prisoners and get those tell-tale kegs to safety. But remember, if I get through alive, I have had no share in this night's adventure. I am now going to visit old Mother Handaway. She is sick. Remember that. She is sick and has sent for the vicar. Saying which, he started off the fat pony along the coast road. As he proceeded along the coast road, Dr. Sin was challenged by two dragoons. But I am Dr. Sin, vicar of Dimchurch, he protested, and I'm visiting a sick woman on the marsh. Sorry, sir, replied one of the soldiers, but we've orders to let no one pass. You'll have to report to the captain. So the doctor trotted beside him along the sea wall. On the beach, around a driftwood fire, they found a group of dragoons mounted guard over their prisoners. I'm sorry this has happened, sir, explained Captain Faunce. We were hunting for Grinsley when we surprised these men unloading a French lugger. I'd rather by far have captured Grinsley, for I know these poor fellows are honest except in this business of the kegs. You too are an honest man, Captain Faunce. If I pledge you my word that this shall never happen again, will you free these unfortunate fellows? I'm sorry, sir. It's too late. I've sent my men for the Sandgate Cutter to arrest them, but as you are visiting a sick woman, let me not be further blamed for having detained you. Dr. Sin looked at the prisoners and was astonished to find many respectable parishioners amongst them. My poor friends, I can do nothing for you, it seems. Turning his pony, he rode up the beach and disappeared into the mist. Not far from Mother Handaway's cottage was a gypsy encampment of horse traders. Dr. Sin rode towards it. As he entered the circle of caravans, a gypsy lad demanded what he wanted. I must see your leader, Silas Pettigrand. The chief is asleep and mustn't be disturbed. Dr. Sin leant from the saddle and whispered a Romany password. In three minutes, Silas of the Pettigrands stood before him. You know my people, it seems, said the gypsy. In Spanish America, yes. I wish to purchase the black horse you have tethered behind your caravan. I noticed him yesterday as I rode in the hills. He'd be difficult for you to manage after that pony. He's wild. I prefer an animal of my own breaking, replied the parson. How much? I will not ask more than twenty guineas. I will give you thirty. Twenty for the horse and ten for your Romany oath of silence concerning the transaction. You shall have him then, answered the old man, and I'll include saddle and bridle. I shall not need a saddle, but a bridle, yes, and spurs until the animal and I are better acquainted. Old Silas left to fetch the horse. He could scarcely believe his eyes when he returned and saw his visitor. The neat parson had given place to the devil in rags. The blacked toe curls which streamed from the battered three-cornered hat and the cruel, reckless deviltry that flashed from the eyes had obliterated a good face with the stamp of hell. Striding towards the black horse, the figure leapt on his back with the ease of a circus rider. Look after my pony, for I shall return on foot and must ride it back to Dimchurch. All very mysterious, eh, friend Silas of the Pettigrams? But believe me, it is not for myself I go adventuring. I am secure in your silence? The gypsy nodded solemnly. For many years the safety of James Bone, the highwayman, has been in my care. Let that satisfy you that I trust you as you may trust me. Till the dawn, cried Dr. Sin, digging in his spurs. The horse reared and plunged furiously, and then off it went with a scream of rage across the fields towards Mother Handaway's hovel. The old woman not only looked like a witch but thought herself one. She was hump-backed, and her hair hung loose in long rat's tails. Mother Handaway had heard the thud of the horse's hooves, and she seemed to expect the visitor, 
for she flung open the door and whimpered, Hail, master. I, replied Sin, in a truly terrible voice. I am your master, your master the devil. But see to it that you tell no one that I favour you by appearing to you in the flesh. For if you do, they will seize you for the witch that you are. Take this bag of guineas. He flung a sack upon the threshold. With it, I buy your stable, in which you will keep my horse. But take care that no one sees it, for if they should, it will mean death. Yes, master. But are you in truth Satan himself that I have raised by my incantations? Aye, but you must call me the Scarecrow, for as such I come to rule the marsh. I shall bring my horse to you before dawn. After that, I shall send my chief messenger to fetch the horse when I need him. How shall I know him, master? I will send him in the guise of a man. Do you know the sexton of Dimchurch? Yes, master. He and the vicar often come to cheer me. Bah! exclaimed Sin scornfully. Are they your only visitors? There is another. I speak of Jimmy Bone, the highwayman. When the chase is hot, I harbour him. That is good. But none of these visitors must set eyes on my horse. What must I call him, master? He is called Jehenna. He is wild. At this, Dr. Sin swung him round and gave him both spurs. The horse leapt forward and galloped away into the rushing mists. The wind now increased till it became a gale with stinging sleet. The frozen shafts of rain stung the horse into madness, and Dr. Sin used the cruel elements to subdue the vice in the horse. He kept the animal facing the storm, and as he rode like the wind towards the distant sea wall, he knew the animal was his. The thrill of it went to Sin's head like wine, and he laughed aloud. On, Jehenna! On! Faster, you great brute! Faster! On the beach, the dragoons tried valiantly to keep their fire alight. Suddenly, one of them cried out, Look! At the same moment, a piercing laugh echoed from the sand hill behind them. Even Captain Faunce was transfixed with horror at the spectral horseman that had appeared. Leave these poor fools alone, cried the figure. I am the man you want, Grinsley! Captain Faunce sprang into the saddle. After him, boys, he cried. Granger and Metcalf, stay here mounted with the prisoners. The troopers scrambled for their horses. Waving his hand in farewell, Sin turned and led the hunt madly across the country. In the meantime, Mips had crawled behind the prisoners and severed their cords with his knife. When he considered that the chase was clear, he sprang out from behind the kegs and covering both troop horses with his pistols, he sang out, About turn, you two, and follow the hunt! What the hell? cried one of the troopers, but Mips interrupted. You've no chance! The prisoners are all free! Twenty of us against you two! The dragoons realised that their only chance of recapturing the men was by getting more help, so they galloped after their colleagues. Quick, lads! cried Mips. Stamp out the fire! Load them kegs onto the ponies! The smugglers were overjoyed at their deliverance. Seems to me, laughs one, that we owe our freedom to Grinsley! That wasn't Grinsley, replied Mips. That's our new leader, if we behave ourselves. It's Jimmy Bone, the highwayman, isn't it? Maybe. But he's to be called the Scarecrow from now on. As dawn broke, Dr. Sin, looking remarkably fresh in his clerical clothes, jogged across the marsh towards Stimchurch. He presented a marked contrast to the dragoon's officer whom he met, Captain Faunce's red coat was mud-stained. I've chased Grinsley all night, said the captain, and to no purpose. I'll swear Grinsley learnt his horsemanship in hell. Where are your men? asked the vicar. I outrode them early on. And the prisoners? Safe under lock and key at Sandgate, I hope. At that moment a trumpet call rang out, and along the sea wall they saw the dragoons riding. The sergeant saw his captain and galloped towards him. We got Grinsley, sir! You've got him? 
Yes, sir. As you disappeared in that first wood, he broke cover on his black horse and we chased him inland to Tenterden. We cornered him and Metcalf ran him through the neck. But I left Metcalf guarding the prisoners. The sergeant then broke the news of the smuggler's escape. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, we can get him again, laughed the officer. I dare swear you can identify your own flock, vicar. I purposely did not look at them, Captain. Dr. Sin stepped out into his garden and surveyed the bright spring morning. Not a sign of his night's exertions could be traced as he walked amongst the flowers, picking the best blooms. He passed on into the squire's house and greeted the family at breakfast. My dear Charlotte, I have picked a few flowers from my garden with an old man's blessings on your birthday. Oh, I'm so spoilt, laughed Charlotte. I accept the lovely gift, but not the description you give with it. An old man's blessing? Why, I never saw anyone look more sprightly. But I want to look old in order to claim the privilege of giving you more than a few marsh flowers, my dear. He handed her the red sachet. Oh, thank you. And my initials on it. Doctor, did you work this? No, it is too neat. Bless you. But open it, please. The beauty and obvious value of the pearls set everyone gasping. The flowers and jewels are both beautiful, cried the delighted Charlotte. When Dr. Sin had confided the history of the pearls and hung them around Charlotte's neck, he handed the logbook to the squire. Well, there's no doubt that Charlotte lives up to your dead captain's hopes, Sir Anthony laughed. I think we can agree that despite her looks, Charlotte's mind is at least beautiful. Dr. Sin spent a pleasant day largely in the company of Charlotte Cobtree, and the early evening found him on his white pony riding beside her. For some time they'd been travelling at a gentle walk, and the doctor's thoughts began to concentrate upon the new life of adventure that seemed to have been thrust upon him. Oh, doctor, whatever makes you scowl like that? Have you forgotten it's my birthday? No, Charlotte, he answered, smiling. But a young girl like you could not be expected to understand the depressions that come with middle age. No? Perhaps I understand them more than anyone else where you are concerned. My father has told me of the tragedy that drove you to America. That's a closed book, said Sin, simply. Not quite. Why do you not accept the fact that your wife is dead? Because I do not know. If I were to marry again and there was a child, and then my wife was found to be alive after all, what then? I would take the risk. I love you. Instinctively, the doctor was disarmed. He felt the warm blood of youth once more in his veins. He dismounted like a young man and stood beneath her, drinking her in as, leaning forward, her hair brushed his face. Why don't you say what is in your heart? she urged. I can say that, he whispered. Yes, at least I can say that with all honesty. I love you, Charlotte. But in all honour I can never ask you to marry me. I would to God I could. Because your wife may be alive, there are other things. Aye, things black and damnable. Did you know the half of them you would turn from me? Let me be the judge of that. Good evening, vicar. Good evening, Miss Cobtree. Mary had approached unseen from the cover of the dyke. Good evening, Mr. Mary, Charlotte said in a voice clear of any embarrassment. The vicar was just checking my saddle. When Dr. Sin turned towards Mary, he was the kindly, elderly parson with a stoop. He looked at Mary's wet boots. What were you doing in the dyke? Avoiding someone, said Mary, looking towards Mother Handaway's cottage. He pointed to a man riding towards them. A highwayman, to be exact. Highwayman, repeated Charlotte. Aye, the famous Jimmy Bone, if you want to know. For a long time I've wished to see him unmasked, and up by the cottage I did. He was arguing with the old witch. Something about a stable he could no longer use. There's a hundred guineas on his head, but I ain't waiting to tell him so. Mary plunged into the cover of the rushes. Jimmy Bone saw the manoeuvre and he galloped across the field and cleared the dyke. In a few seconds he was alongside Mary and had pulled from his holster a long pistol. Come out! 
It's your money or your life, you water rat. Mr Bone, is it likely I had money? Whined Mary. Likely? I should say it's certain, considering how you was give a gold spade for carrying a message from certain gents I knows in right, so toss her up. I'm a poor man, said Mary, reluctantly holding out the coin. And I'll be the richer by a guinea, laughed the highwayman, taking it. And now I'll deal with these others. Why, sakes alive, if it ain't a parson, and an old one too. For while the highwayman had been attending to Mary, Dr Sin had put on his reading spectacles. Why, I never yet robbed a parson. Now, the lady is different. I'll relieve you, miss, of the pretty pearl string around your neck. Dr Sin walked towards him. No nearer, reverend sir, warned Mr Bone. Dr Sin stopped. Whether you will get the lady's pearls remains to be seen but it is quite certain that you will have to fight me first. Do you mean a duel, Reverend Sir? <laughs> is it possible that you carry a pistol in one of those long pockets? Dr Sin shook his head. No, I do not carry a pistol, though strange as it may seem, I know a great deal about them. Now I take it, Mr Bone, that the pistol you are pointing at me is made more to intimidate than to give an exhibition of accurate shooting. I can hit a mark nine times out of ten. Very well, said Dr. Sin. Now it is a virtue of mine that I never stare abroad without a piece of chalk and a good sharp knife. My knife, he fumbled in his pocket and produced it, is, as you see, a good one. It is a knife to throw, Mr. Bone, and, like your pistol, I shall boast of it that nine times out of ten it hits the mark. Now, before we settle this business concerning the pearls, I will lay you a guinea against the one you have appropriated from Mary that I can throw more accurately than you can shoot. Here's the chalk. I make a mark on this old gatepost. So, now, Mr Bone, make good your boast. Mr Bone chuckled beneath his mask. You're a queer cove, ain't you? Well, I'll win your guinea, and then I'll take the lady's pearls. He leapt to the ground and walked back some yards from the post. That's far enough to be counted a good shot, eh? Just as you like, replied the parson. Mr Bone steadied his pistol and fired. There! I've driven in the very centre of your chalk mark. Dr Sin smiled. I think that you have missed the mark entirely. But you have nine more shots. I'll find a bullet first before I waste more powder, snapped Mr Bone. He thrust the cumbersome horse pistol into the holster and walked over to the post. However, as he ran his hand over the wood, he found that the parson was right. Charlotte, meanwhile, was watching Dr. Sin and saw what the highwayman had got his back to. Sin's left hand drew the horse pistol from the holster and with a sudden jerking swing flung the knife with full force. With an oath, the highwayman sprang aside only to find his movement arrested for the flying knife was driven through his broad lace cuff. "'I found your sleeve a more tempting mark, Mr Bone,' said Dr Sin, advancing with a horse pistol levelled. "'Here's your guinea. Or do you mean to try for the reward?' "'Oh, dear no, Mr Bone. I said that you'd have to fight me to get the pearls. Mr Merry, you will act for Mr Bone, while Miss Cobtree will act for me.' "'Miss Cobtree, eh?' repeated Mr Bone. She'd been a daughter of Cobtree the Magistrate, and ain't he the cove what has put a hundred guineas round my neck? Seems to me, then, not unfair for me to take the pearls from his daughter's neck. As you please, Mr Bone. Mary, you will pluck out my knife there while I help Miss Cobtree dismount. Why not send him packing? Charlotte whispered as he lifted her to the ground. You have the pistol and I have the pearls. Because, my dear, I wish to show you that you have not given your love to a weakling. She was about to answer when Mary, who had pulled the knife from the post, suddenly sprang at the highwayman. With a savage curse, Mr Bone ducked, and with a sledgehammer blow knocked Mary backwards into the water. He deserved that, Mr Bone, said Dr Sin. Aye, he was tempted by the reward old Cobtree's put up. But now... Master Parson, my advice to you is not to tempt me to deal with you as I dealt with him. 
I'd rather have them pearls without a fight and ride up peaceful. Possibly, but oh no, laughed the doctor. At least I shall be very surprised if you ride off with the pearls, but I'll take off my glasses and coat, and I suggest you take off your riding coat. Do you mean we're to fight with fists? But my dear Mr. Bone, you see, I have got ready. Well, it's not my habit to linger too long in one spot, true. There's no one visible likely to cause me trouble, and I've been warned that the dragoons are out. So come along, my gallant gamecock. Let's hope your preaching's better than your fighting. Oh, I hope it is. Mr. Bone suddenly rushed forward. Dr. Zinn stood his ground, and though Charlotte was terrified at the tornado attack of the highwayman, she was surprised to see him stagger back with his hand on his jaw. Dr. Sin had apparently parried the sledgehammer blows and struck once, but the stroke got home. Mr. Bone felt blood trickling down his neck, and this infuriated him. He now attacked with lower blows, and at last landed a murderous stroke into the parson's ribs. Dr. Sin drew his breath with an audible hiss, then he calmly removed his wig and threw it on the grass. He was facing the distant clump of dim church trees, and it was then that he saw the evening sun flashing upon the dragoon's brass helmets. Now Dr. Sin had only to mention this fact to Mr. Bone to terminate the fight, but against this was his desire to finish as the victor in Charlotte's eyes, and this made him risk the highwayman's safety. He sprang into the attack like a mad hurricane, and Mr. Bone got a taste of his own smashing method. Back he was driven with well-landed blows towards the dyke, and after a left hook to the jaw, down went Mr. Bone, blinded with blood that soaked through his mask. It was then that Mr. Merry saw the distant dragoons, and determined to gain the hundred guineas for the taking of Mr. Bone, he leapt onto Charlotte's horse and galloped away at full speed. Quick, Charlotte! The man is none so badly hurt, but that rogue is for putting his neck in a halter. Dr. Sin removed the bloodstained mask from the dazed man. He's coming round. Well, Mr. Parson... I own when I'm beat. <clears throat> he twisted his lips into a smile. But have you got to take off my mask? Your face is safe as far as we are concerned. And the sooner you get onto your horse, the better, for Mary has ridden off to put the dragoons on your tail. The highwayman struggled up and looked at the distant rider. Aye, and the curse of it is the old witch who lives yonder will no longer give me stable room. I'll see to it that the old woman gives you safe hiding. Dr. Sin recovered his wig. She's mad, sir. Said the devil has forbidden her to see me. If a parson cannot override the devil, he's no use at his job, laughed the doctor. Now, let me mount your horse and you get up behind me. Charlotte, you mount the pony and trot over by the bridge. He sprang into the saddle, but the highwayman's horse plunged and reared till Mr. Bone quietened him. You ride as well as you fight, Master Parson, he said, mounting his horse with difficulty. Hang on, cried Dr. Sin, and he set the horse to the gallop. As Charlotte watched them, she realised that Sin was the best rider on the marsh, and the discovery made her understand many things that had long puzzled her. When she reached Mother Handaway's cottage, she was met by the old witch. Oh, Miss Cobtree, never come and visit me more, and above all, never have dealings with the vicar of Dimchurch. He is the devil. What has happened to the real vicar, I cannot tell, but the devil is going around the marsh in the likeness of him. I am his stablewoman. I feed his fierce black horse, and I must call him the Scarecrow, he tells me. And where is this black horse of his? asked Charlotte, resolved to humour the old woman. In the hidden stable. It's a pit built of stone behind the barn. It was made by the smuggler years ago. I once saved Jimmy Bone, the highwayman, by giving him shelter there, and ever since he's used it when the chase was hot. The devil told me never to let him use it again. But then he suddenly appears in the likeness of Dr. Sin and has stowed the highwayman there. There's room enough for ten horses and no one could find the door. Ah, those smugglers, they knew things in those days. Dr. Sin agreed that they had been cunning fellows who built the door which he had just fastened behind him. It stood in the side of the dyke, and when closed looked nothing but a heap of reeds. Satisfied that all was well, 
he walked along the dike and met Charlotte, riding his pony. And now, my dear, he said, smiling, we are just in time to meet the dragoons. The soldiers drew up on the high road while Captain Fonts, led by Mary, still mounted on Charlotte's horse, came galloping across the fields. You never let him go, sir, cried Mary. He'll have cost me a hundred guineas. Dr. Sin smiled. And what are a hundred guineas compared to the safekeeping of Miss Cobtree's pearls? Good evening, Captain Fonts. If you wish to reach the Sussex border before the masked gentleman, I should recommend a cross-country gallop as quick as possible. This man tells me that you gave him a leathering. I learnt in a scientific school, that is all, sir, said the doctor. Besides, Miss Cobtree's pearls were in danger, so what else could I do? God forbid me, but fight. Might as well chase highwaymen as smugglers, laughed the captain. It's all in a day's work. Hand over Miss Cobtree's horse, you, and get up behind Trooper Harker. As the party of dragoons galloped away, Charlotte and the doctor turned towards Dimchurch. Do you believe our highwayman played the scarecrow last night in order to help the smugglers? Where did you get that idea? From Mr. Mipps, of course. I get all my gossip from him, and I have a feeling we are to hear more from this scarecrow, whoever he may be. The doctor smiled. You'll be adding another adventurous rascal to your romantic list soon. You mean Clegg the pirate? Dr. Sin laughed. He, at least, seems to have disappeared. It is a long time since you talked to him. You know his adventures thrilled me when you first spoke of them to my father. You may take it from me that the rascal is dead. Charlotte shook her head. Only to the authorities. You are a strange, romantic girl, Charlotte. I was stupid to put Clegg into your birthday thoughts. It wasn't your remark that put him in my thoughts. It was this. She drew from her riding coat the red velvet sachet. When you gave it to me this morning, I wondered where I'd seen it before. And then I remembered. It was the colour worn by my romantic ghost. She told him the story of the figure dressed in red. That was nothing. It was my farewell to vanity. You see, I was not always a practising person in America. I went there for revenge. God forgive me. You cut this, then, from the red coat? I did. It was Mipps who talked to me about Clegg, Charlotte went on. He described him as a short, thick-set man. Ah, but you should have seen him in battle, calmly stalking the poop deck in his red velvet. Dr. Sin sighed. So, the red velvet reminded you of Clegg, eh? Doctor... When you are ready to tell me all your secrets, then I'll be ready to marry you. I could protect you if I knew everything. And remember, I have added to my heroes the scarecrow who saved the villagers last night. Your heroes? Clegg the pirate, the scarecrow smuggler, and Dr. Sin the fighting preacher. Perhaps some day, Charlotte, I'll be weak enough to tell you all. I shall wait till you do. Captain Faunce was piqued. The fact that he had failed to arrest the highwayman was annoying, especially as he was convinced that Jimmy Bone was also the mysterious scarecrow. Amongst others that believed it was the preventative officer. But he was not the man to earn a hundred guineas on a man's head. Jimmy Bone was popular amongst the poor, and if he was arrested on information received, it would be short shrift for the informer. This knowledge frightened Mary, and he persuaded Dr. Sin to let him slip over to Rye until the marsh became safer. After a particularly long day of parochial work, Dr. Sin had invited Mipps for a drink in his study. As they sat down, there was a creak above them. The sexton cocked his head at the ceiling. Someone's upstairs. They left the room quietly, Dr. Sin going first with a pistol in his hand. At the top of the stairs, he pushed open his bedroom door. Whoever you are... Come out. I am armed. No shooting, a voice answered. I'll come to you for help. A man appeared in the doorway. Dr. Sin smiled. Ah, it is my friend, Mr. Bone. I trust you will honour me by having some of my excellent brandy. 
In the study, Dr. Sin poured out three glasses of brandy. You may remove your mask, Mr. Byrne. My sexton you may trust as myself, and I'd like to see whether your jaw is recovered. And that's the devil of it, sir. There's a scar upon it that's keeping me prisoner. I work in a mask. How can I drink in a tavern and pick up information in this thing? Mr. Bone removed his mask and flung it on the table. Dr. Sin handed his guest a glass of brandy. And now I've got the preventative officer on me track. He's after me because he says I'm the scarecrow. Are you? asked Mips. Mr. Bone gave the sexton a withering scowl. No, I am not. Why should I be handy down for something I'm not doing? I see your point, said Dr. Sin. But how can I help you? Well, Mr. Parson, <clears throat> it comes to this. The vicar of Dimchurch has got the reputation of keeping folks' business to himself. My dear sir, that is merely one of the duties of a parson. So they tell me, replied Bone. Now, that evening when you set this mark upon my face, you also saved my life. In so doing, you showed me a fierce black horse that I take to belong to my brother outlaw, this scarecrow. Now, I was wondering if you could get this mysterious gentleman to free me from taking over his responsibilities. He's the one man who could do it. But how? Well, there's a rumour whispered that on the night of the full moon there's to be a run. Now, sir, I got a little job upon my own that night. There's a coach journeying from London to this coast and it's going to be full of guineas for agents in France. But the traitors are smuggling it to our enemies and intend to rob both England and France of the lot. And where do you fit in, Mr. Bone? Well, Reverend Sir, I'm doing their dirty work. Mr. Bone, gentleman of the road, is to hold up the coach, and then he's to hand over the bulk of the money to these double traitors. But, possession being nine points of the law, they can whistle with their money. And where does the scarecrow come in? Why, Reverend Sir, like this. I holds up the coach and gets the guineas. And then up gallops the scarecrow, and on behalf of the Dimchurch smugglers, he robs Mr Bone. The scarecrow's men then remove the guineas to a place agreed, and the two then go shares. And the story gets around that poor Mr Bone has been robbed by the scarecrow. Dr. Sin chuckled. Well, Mr. Bone, I'll see what can be done for you. He raised his glass, and then looking first at Mips, and then at Mr. Bone, added, And if so be that this scarecrow refuses to free you from your embarrassment, why, damn man, if I don't dress up as the scarecrow myself and rob you of those guineas. And he drank the brandy at a gulp. Good God! muttered Mips. Dr. Sin, in his capacity of Dean of the Peculiars, periodically preached in the magnificent parish church of Rye. Whenever he took the short journey into Sussex, he would put up at the Mermaid Tavern, where he was an ever-welcome guest. It was there that Mr. Merry found himself readily enough employed upon presenting his credentials from the doctor. The tavern was busy, but it was towards two guests that Merry chiefly focused his attention. These two men were something of a mystery to the townsfolk of Rye. Although adorned with much lace and finery, they were both sufficiently independent from the prevalent fashion of exquisites to wear bearded chins. The shorter of the two, who called himself Colonel Delacourt, was stockily built and tattooed like a South Sea Islander. The other, Captain Vicosa, was a red-bearded giant. Colonel Delacourt gave out that they had made their fortune in the Indies and had come to England on business. The reason for their enforced stay at the Mermaid was the fact that Madame Delacourt had given birth to a daughter on the night of their arrival, and although the child was doing well, the mother was rapidly sinking. The Rye doctor who attended her said that she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, but he owned he was going to be hard put to save her life. Her husband's manner to her was loud and rude, and yet he showed great affection to the baby. He would lurch into the room when far advanced in drink, take the child and carry it into the adjoining room where he diced and drank with the red-bearded Captain Vic. Mary gave a thousand little services to the two men. 
He had taken a bottle of brandy to the colonel one afternoon when, from outside, they heard the notes of a coach horn. More visitors, said the colonel, going to the window. Let's hope it's someone to play dice with. And then he gave a cry. What the devil's wrong with you? growled the red-bearded one. He got to his feet and went to the casement. There's only two passengers alighting and I fail to see why they should upset you. A doddering old parson and a shabby servant, I suppose. A little cove with a ridiculous blunderbuss under his arm. Doddering parson be damned, gasped the colonel. Who are they, Mary? asked Captain Vick. Do you know him? Oh, I knows him too well, said Mary, looking down. And I wishes them both more ill luck than I fear will come to him. That's Parson Sin of Dimchurch and his sexton, Mips. Parson Sin be damned, snapped the colonel. It's Clegg, I tell you. I and the little rat with the blunderbuss is his ship's carpenter. Two of the bloodiest pirates that ever terrorised the sea and my most mortal enemies. What did you say, sir? asked Mary, hardly able to believe what he had heard. Whereupon Colonel Delacourt recounted some of the terrors of Clegg and how Clegg had followed him from sea to sea in order to get his revenge. And revenge for what? he exploded. Why, for robbing him of the burden next door. I mean my wife, Mr. Mary. Your wife? Was the parson sweet on her, sir? Sweet? He was married to her, you fool. And I carried her off. She's his wife in the eyes of the law, not mine, but the child's mine. The news was getting better and better. Mary couldn't believe it. Here was Dr. Sin's wife in the possession of another man, but still Dr. Sin's wife. And this pirate talk of Clegg. That would be sufficient weapon against the doctor. There was a bigger price on Clegg's head than on a hundred Jimmy Bones. How long does this parson stay? asked the colonel. Mary told him that he came on the Saturday and stayed in the Mermaid till Monday. He'll preach a sermon tomorrow morning, and then dine with the rector, but he'll drink tonight in the common bar. Then we must lie low. We'll admit no one with the sawbones. Mary shall watch for us. We are prisoners here until the fellow leaves. Mary told much about Dr. Sin to these men with whom he shared a common hatred. Both the Colonel and Captain Vick dropped their attitude of master to a servant. They sat Mary down, plied him with drink, and vowed they were all friends together, and as gentlemen they would take an oath to hound Dr. Sin to his death. Mary was in favour of a public accusation against him as Clegg, but to this the Colonel would not consent. We'll kill him first and accuse him after, so that his tongue cannot wag against me. As Colonel Delacourt, I am safe enough, but as Nick Tappet, well, there are things I have no wish to be made public. Flattered by their friendliness, Mary went on to tell them of his passion for Meg Clowder, whom he described in such glowing terms that Captain Vick became so enthusiastic on Mary's behalf that he avowed he would win Meg for him. You're a morose sort of devil, he declared, filling Mary's glass. When I have a way with women, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll marry the wench myself and then abandon her. You can then take her on the rebound. How's that? It was decided that Captain Vick should set off immediately by post-chase to Dimchurch. And you'll not take it unkindly of me, friend Mary? asked Captain Vick, if I make love to this Meg of yours in good earnest. You can do what you like with her. Break her spirits, my captain, then throw her to me, so that I possess her at last. Aye, and her in too. You can do your worst to her. So the red-bearded one departed, happy that he was escaping from the gloom of Madame Delacourt's sickbed and with the prospect of a diverting adventure. Just as the colonel was figuring that Captain Vick would have arrived in Dimchurch, Mary announced the local physician. Colonel Delacourt, your wife is sinking. She has not the will to exert her strength, and without that will I am useless. Now it happens that there is alighted at this inn a man of high spirituality. He is beloved by all, and it is his mission in life to attend to the comforts of afflicted souls. In short, 
It is Dr. Sin, vicar of the place called Dimchurch. I will bring him up with your permission. Which you will not get, my interfering doctor, growled the colonel. My wife is a foreigner, and the last person she would wish to see is an English parson. There, Colonel Delacourt, I must contradict you. I spoke of this man to your good lady, and as I spoke I could see that her spirit seemed to burn with a new life. Sir, I do not desire spiritual advice from you or your friends, said the colonel angrily. Let me have no more of this parson nonsense. Good day. In the meantime, Captain Vick had arrived in Dimchurch and entered the bar of the City of London. To say that he lifted poor Meg off her feet is but to state a literal truth, for he lifted her over the counter and carried her out like a baby to the sea wall, crying in one breath to the potboy to mind the custom, and in the next declaring his undying passion for the girl in his arms. He kept vowing that he loved her, and that when he had heard of her beauty he had known she was the wife for him and had set off immediately to claim her. When Meg heard that it was Mary who had raved about her, she trembled with fear and told her lover of her dread. He assured her that she need have no fear of any man while he lived to protect her, and he went on in the most gentlemanly fashion to tell her the arrangements he would make for their immediate wedding. On Monday I will ride into Hythe, my Meg, take out a special license, and then we will be married. Thus it was that Meg and Captain Vic departed one morning by special coach to Hythe and came back as man and wife. One evening, after his return from Rye, Dr. Sin dined with the Cobtrees, in order, as he put it, to learn all the gossip. Well, said the squire, Charlotte has at last chosen her twenty-first birthday present from me, and you'll never guess what it is. You see, Doctor, like all other romantic misses of the neighbourhood, she's thought fit to admire this mysterious scarecrow, because he saved the dim church lads, so she must now have a black horse. Why? Oh, because the scarecrow rode a black horse. So did the highwayman, added Dr. Sin, laughing across the table at Charlotte. And the other news, continued the squire, is that Meg Clowder has gone off to Hythe and returned married, if you please, married to some captain who claims to be a gentleman, but who's returned to take up his married quarters in the city of London. Charlotte called in yesterday to see her, and it was, Oh, Miss Charlotte, what do you think has been and done? Whereupon, added Charlotte, out there steps the bravest-looking gentleman, tall and handsome, with the largest red beard you ever saw. I should not have been surprised that he announced that he was Clegg the pirate. Instead of Captain Vicosa, eh? said Sin. For I take it that in these clean-shaven days there are not two handsome adventurers with red beards in the neighbourhood, and I heard tell of such a man at the Mermaid Inn. Do you know anything about him? asked the squire. Nothing except that he and his companion have adopted that rogue Mary as their particular satellite. No doubt that's how the captain heard of Meg. Well, we'll keep an eye on him, whoever he may be, said the squire. Late that evening in the vicarage, Dr. Sin sat with Mipps, surveying a large map of Romney Marsh. When the various dispositions of horses and pack ponies had been settled, the doctor produced the brandy bottle and pledged success to the greatest run ever planned by the marsh smugglers. And if your leaders carry out my orders to the letter, I can see no flaw in the campaign, my good Mips. I have allowed some information to get through to Captain Fonts. Aye, sir, I suppose you've a good reason. The very best of reasons, Mips. It is essential that the dragoons, or at least a few of them, should be witness to the robbing of that coach. They can then establish the fact that Jimmy Bone is not the Scarecrow. But nothing must be left to chance. That's why I've called out the men three nights before the run to rehearse in full detail, and the Marsh men's profits will be doubled. Mips grinned. Same plan both nights, eh, sir? With one difference. On the first night, you and I will command the beach, and the Upton brothers will fire the beacon from Aldington Knoll, which will bring the luggers ashore. But on the second night... I'll leave you on the beach, and the scarecrow will fire the beacon. Mips pulled a face. I prefer us to ride at your side, sir. But there could be delays with the post horses. Until that coach arrives on Quarry Hill, Mr. Bone cannot hold it up, and the scarecrow will be powerless to rob him. 
But just as soon as the guineas are safely removed by the Scarecrow's men, why then the Scarecrow will ride hell for leather and fire the beacon. I see, sir, but no buts, Master Carpenter. And keep your eye on that bridegroom of poor Meg's. According to our friend Bone, he's one of these double-dealing guinea runners. By the way, Mips, I notice you're wearing your Sunday suit these days. I'm glad you've discarded your old coat. I'll pay for a new one if you order it. The new suit's ordered and paid for, sir. Miss Charlotte gave me two guineas for the old one. She wanted it for beats me. But Dr. Sin was thinking of Charlotte's new horse, and the two purchases began to find a connection in his mind. Cheer up, sir. Never seen you look so serious since the time you marooned that horrible mulatto on the coral reef. Aye. We've seen things. That we has, returned Mips. And the glimpse I got of that red-bearded captain of Meg's when I was in the city of London tonight put me in mind of something. Remember a few years back in Havana, when you was after Black Nick at that planter's house? Sin nodded. He'd told the authorities who I was. But what put that in your mind? Well, sir, that there planter was a tall fellow with red hair. Bit queer if it was the same fellow who only growed a beard. It would be very queer, Mips, replied Sin, thoughtfully. Neither Captain Faunce nor the preventative officer were meant to ignore the information they had gleaned about the Scarecrow's proposed run on the night of the full moon, and three days before, the village saw the arrival of Colonel Truebridge and a full squadron of dragoons from Dover Castle. They commandeered the field behind the sea wall while Dr. Sin was inspecting Charlotte's new black hunter in the squire's stables. And will you tell me, my dear, why you have not only bought this glorious animal when you already have a horse, but also why you purchased that old suit from poor Mips? For I believe I see the semblance of a connection between the two purchases. And that semblance is? she asked. The Scarecrow? How clever you are, Doctor. Yes, you are right. But I trust you'll keep your guess to yourself. I want to find out who this Scarecrow is. And now I have the horse and the clothes too. If the Scarecrow cannot trust me and say I am the Scarecrow, why, I can ride out as he does until I can say, Ah, so you are the Scarecrow. I beg of you, Charlotte, not to undertake such a rash adventure. My dear Doctor, when you ask me to marry you, why, then I promise I will mend my ways, but till then... He might then and there have made the confession that had been in his heart to make for her to some time, but the squire joined them full of indignation about the new arrival of dragoons. Captain Fawns is a nice enough fellow, I admit, he cried, but this colonel is as red in his temper as his face. I almost wish this scarecrow fellow would give him a good fooling. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he does, father, said Charlotte with a mischievous glance at Dr. Sin. I shouldn't be at all surprised either, my dear, replied the doctor solemnly. And sure enough, the fooling that the squire wished for took place that very night. Although certain hints had been allowed to get through to Colonel Truebridge, no one gave away the important fact that thousands of barrels were only awaiting the signal from Aldington to be landed on Jesson Beach and carried to the hills. The Upton brothers had been instructed to fire their beacon two hours after lanterns out had been sounded by the dragoon trumpeters. This time was nearly up. The marsh lay black and ominous, a vast stretch of mystery to the dragoon sentry who stood guard upon the sea wall. But then the moon came up over the channel and flooded the marsh with its eerie light. The sentry thought he had never seen a vast track of land and dikes so desolate. He did not know that those dikes were filled with crouching, waiting men. He turned in the direction of Folkestone and the increasing moonlight showed him a sight that made him gasp. A lugger had been run out ashore some hundred yards away. There were men sitting on barrels facing a man who leant against the mast. He was dressed as a scarecrow. What were the orders? Any rank meeting with a man dressed as a scarecrow may shoot to kill. Death to the scarecrow! The sentry dropped down beneath the sand hill that crowned the sea wall. As he dropped, Mips slithered upon his stomach immediately behind him and wriggled down the slope. 
With a knife between his teeth, he crawled towards the horse lines guarded by two sleepy dragoons. Along the lines he crawled, noiselessly severing the picketing ropes. The sentry took his time, steadying his aim. Death to the scarecrow! He must not miss. And behind him crouched two men, their faces smeared with tar, waiting for him to shoot. Under the shadow of the sea wall, Mips went on with his cutting. Suddenly, one horse stampeded down the lines. Where, horse? cried a guard. The noise acted upon the nerves of the sentry, and he fired. Immediately, there arose pandemonium from the sleeping camp. The sentry heard it for a few seconds only, for he was flung onto the sands by the two men and for a time remembered nothing. In the awakened camp, everything was in wild disorder. The majority of the horses were heading in a wild stampede towards Hythe. The colonel, in night attire, shouted for Captain Faunce to turn out the guard. Stand your horses, you fools! he roared. But there were no horses that his men could stand to. It was then that a strange apparition galloped at full speed through the camp. A snorting black horse on whose back sat the fearsome figure of a man dressed as a scarecrow. With cries of, Go, Jehenna! The figure passed within a few yards of the colonel's tent, laughing in his face. Catch him! Kill him! shouted the colonel, pulling on his breeches and drawing his sabre. But the scarecrow was already riding up the steep bank of the sea wall. Death to the scarecrow! yelled the colonel, running after him. But by the time he was halfway up the bank, the scarecrow was galloping over the hard sands towards Jesson. Where's the sentry? shouted the colonel. What the hell was he doing? The sound of his colonel's voice brought the sentry in question back to his wits. He cried out from the sands, I've shot the scarecrow! There, sir! The colonel looked and saw the group a hundred yards away. There they are, some of them. Come on, men! We'll capture the man, the lugger! Forward, my men! Followed by some half-dozen half-dressed dragoons, the gallant colonel went down the steps and with sabre drawn ran towards the group of smugglers. Surrender, damn you! Hands up! Exasperated that not one of the sitting men deigned to move, he delivered a resounding smack with the flat of his sabre against the back of the nearest smuggler, who fell forward. What the hell? Hell indeed for a colonel to hear the laughter of his troopers, for the smugglers and their leader were but effigies. Dummies of straw-filled clothes. But the barrels were not dummies, and chalked around their hoops was the following message. To our gallant dragoons from the Scarecrow. Drink, boys, to the Scarecrow and his night riders. Get this stuff to camp, said the colonel. We'll drink damnation to this impertinent fellow. He turned and swore a mighty oath, for a huge beacon burned on Aldington Knoll and signals were being flashed across the marsh. The flying black horse of the Scarecrow was approaching Jesson Beach, which now literally swarmed with men, and under full sail was a fleet of some twenty boats, luggers and smacks. The organisation was perfect. The men on the beach waded out to meet the grounding fleet. The dragoons ran to the high road, hoping to cut inland and arrest the procession of pack ponies making for the cover of the hills, but there was nothing to attack. By the time they reached the hills, they could see nothing moving on the marsh, and the fleet were already far out in the bay. For the next two days, the colonel blustered and quarrelled with the squire and was eventually only calmed down by Dr. Sin, who came forward with a suggestion for dealing with the scarecrow. Since the good name of Romney Marsh is at stake, he declared, I intend to ask for volunteers who will help your good fellows rout out this scarecrow. At the Sunday morning service, the doctor appealed to all good men and true to stand by the law, and as the congregation filed out, names were taken by the sexton of all those who would help. To each man who was enrolled in this band of volunteers was presented a white armlet, and on that very Sunday evening, Dr. Sin rode out on his white pony to review a hundred and fifty Dimchurch men who had answered the call. This astonishing response was due to the fact that Mips had passed the word from the Scarecrow himself that every smuggler was to wear the armlet of Dr. Sin. Colonel Truebridge was impressed. He admired the quiet way in which the vicar handled the difficult situation. Although some of the smugglers more than suspected that the reverend gentleman would be very grieved did his measures help to bring death to the Scarecrow. 
but the doctor was in full agreement with the squire for causing broadsheets to be printed with Death to the Scarecrow set out in bold type. The belief that the wanted man was none other than James Bone, the notorious highwayman, was printed beneath this heading. Death to the Scarecrow. Captain Vick kept reading it on the wall in Meg's bar parlour, and he set out on horseback to see his colleague at Rye. He had a good deal to discuss with Colonel Delacourt, for he had listened to whisperings that had gone on in the bar, and he knew very well that Jimmy Bone was not the Scarecrow. Indeed, he had hit upon a theory of his own. Dr. Sin was Clegg. He knew it, and so did the Colonel. But what if Clegg were the Scarecrow? A man of brains, courage and quick invention, safely hidden under the parson's cloth. The more he thought of it, the more certain he believed it to be true. When Captain Vick arrived in Rye, he found Colonel Delacourt sober but irritable. His wife, while sinking slowly, kept asking her husband to allow her a visit from Dr. Sin. She doesn't seem to see my danger. Get some wine and I'll soon set your heart at ease, laughed the captain. Mary was sent to bring wine. Sit down, Mary, for I owe you a drink. I've married your Meg, but I ain't given her up yet. Although if Bone gets caught tomorrow, we may have to run for it. Run for it, scowled the colonel. What about me? Why, you'll run too, my buck, and I'll not leave the child. Captain Vick laughed. A couple of bearded bucks running round the country with a baby. <laughs> That'll be a fine sight. No, you'll leave her here. Why not return your wife to Dr. Sen, eh? Mary tells me he's sweet on that pretty piece of baggage the squire's daughter. I've no wish to identify Colonel Delacourt with Nicholas Tappet. Nor shall you. At first, I need to send a letter to this Charlotte Corbtree. Captain Vick placed a paper on the table. The Colonel and Mary read together, Death to the Scarecrow. Now, don't imagine I've done nothing but make love to Mary's Meg. No, I've listened. Tomorrow night, this Scarecrow is going to run again. Clegg's never wanted in daring. Clegg? Clegg, for believe me, Clegg, Dr. Sin, and the Scarecrow are one and the same. An unholy trinity, if ever there was. On the way, I rode by Aldington Knoll. There was a burnt-out beacon. There was also a yokel piling wood in readiness. For what? A run, tomorrow. And take it from me, the Scarecrow will fire the beacon. What then? asked the colonel. Why, we three will be waiting for him. Mary's in with us. As the scarecrow fires the beacon, we will fire to kill. Death to the scarecrow, says the law. That will not be murder. Death to the scarecrow. The words went round and round in Charlotte Cobtree's brain. It was Monday night and she sat through dinner next to Dr. Sin and listened to Colonel Truebridge telling him and the squire exactly where he would be patrolling in a few hours' time. Faunce has given those Upton lads their orders. By the time Scarecrow sends a signal to his luggers, the marsh will be hiding 150 resolute men wearing white armlets. My men and I will patrol under the hills. Poor Scarecrow, sighed Dr. Sin. You've left nothing to chance. But I think you're wasting your best man, Captain Faunce. What's he doing? asked the squire. Faunce suspects that facetious little sexton Mips is involved with the scarecrow, explained the colonel. And he set himself the task of watching him. Although, of course, there is no thought of arresting Mips. I should think not indeed, put in Dr. Sin. On condition that they retired to bed, the squire promised to rouse his daughters if he heard any news. Charlotte went to her room. On her dressing table, she saw a sealed letter. 
Fear with his icy fingers clutched at her heart when she opened it. Death to the scarecrow. It was one of the broadsheets, but there was writing on the back. Honoured Madame, a gentleman residing at Rye has given me certain information with instructions to act upon it in his interests. We have been given to suppose that you are in love with Dr. Sin, vicar of Dimchurch. If this is so, then do as this letter instructs, or you will see your reverend lover upon a common scaffold. He is wanted by many governments, and by England not the least, as he is none other than the notorious pirate Clegg. Furthermore, knowing that the scarecrow is not Mr. James Bone, the highwayman, it occurs to us that he might prove to be Clegg, or shall we say, Dr. Sin? The gentleman instructing me has made up his mind to get the reward for denouncing Clegg. You have only to bring us the pearls which Sin took from the figurehead of the wreck, and we will keep this knowledge to ourselves. Bring them to me before dinner at the City of London. I am, madame, your obedient servant, Captain Vicosa. Charlotte rang the bell for the housekeeper. Who brought this letter? That odious man Mary brought it, Miss Charlotte. Said it concerned your lover. <laughs> it is, Dr. Sin, but there are certain wicked men who are his enemies. And this very night he is in danger, and I must warn him. Give me a cloak. I will go down the back stairs, but there's something I must get first. From a drawer she produced a bundle of rags. Clutching these, she drew on a voluminous black cloak with a hood which covered her face. Tell the others I'm tired and do not want to be disturbed until breakfast time. I'll be back by then. Charlotte made her way quietly to the stables and harnessed up her horse. She never doubted the accuracy of the accusation against the man she loved, for she had already half guessed, and she was now on her way to a man who could tell her the truth. But there, on the high road, in front of the shed where Mips worked, was Captain Faunce, and there was a guard on the bridge. Charlotte thought quickly. Then, with her hood over her face, she passed Captain Faunce and in a rustic voice said, Dark night, mister. Where are you going, my good woman? The marsh is not too healthy tonight, for the soldiers are out after the smugglers. Aye, mister, I knows it well. For ain't I the wife of the new riding officer from Sandgate? He stopped at the ship inn for a bit of information. I works there. His horse has a loose shoe, and since the farrier has gone with them volunteers and Mr. Mipps here as a forge, I've come to see him. Hope he's awake. I heard you, replied a voice from the cottage. Not asleep yet, Mr. Mipps? asked Captain Faunce. How can I sleep thinking of you dragoons hanging about? Bring your old man's nag round the back, missus. Charlotte led the horse round to the forge while Mr. Mipps unfastened the doors. As soon as they were closed again, he picked up a hammer and began to strike it on the anvil. Thought at first it was the scarecrow's horse, he whispered. Who are you now? Charlotte pushed back her hood. Miss Charlotte, whatever has happened? He banged on the anvil. We can trust one another, Mips, I know, for we both love your master. We love him as Dr. Sin, just as we love him as Clegg or the scarecrow. So he blowed the gaff to a pretty girl and never told me. He's told me nothing, Mips. He would not betray another's secret. But love can solve most riddles. Read this. You take the hammer, miss. Every time I kick, give the anvil a good'un. That'll keep Fawns quiet. He read the letter. You give this rascal the pearls. I got the letter too late. Mary brought it. Yes, he thinks he'll get the pearls himself. Well, he's as good as dead already. But the scarecrow must not die, Mips, and we must save him. I can just get out of here. You'd never get through, Mips. The dragoons would shoot you down. But I can go as I came. And look here. She took out the bundle of clothes. I will dress in these, and on my black horse I shall look sufficiently like the scarecrow to pass through the smuggler's lines. Where can I find the doctor? He'll be waiting up Quarry Hill, returned Mips. 
He explained about the scarecrow rubbing Jimmy Bone. Then, when he's done, Dr. Sin, or let's just say the scarecrow, is going to fire the beacon. Here, miss, here's that hammer. You hurry along and change your clothes over there. He dealt a few lusty strokes upon the anvil. Will I do? Charlotte asked a few minutes later. Mipps turned and grinned. Well, miss, you're the best-looking scarecrow I ever see. But cover yourself with your cloak till you're out of sight of the dragoons. Now, don't forget, Quarry Hill. Captain Faunce was waiting outside. He walked his horse beside Charlotte's to where one of his troopers sat on guard. Escort this woman to the City of London, he ordered. Married, lass, the trooper whispered when they were out of sight of the captain. He slipped from his horse and laid hold of Charlotte's hood. But she swung out with her riding switch and the dragoon stumbled backwards. Charlotte jumped on her horse and as she set off full tilt down the street, her hood fell back and the trooper saw that his pretty girl was the scarecrow. He ran back towards Captain Faunce, crying out that the scarecrow had once more slipped through their fingers. Captain Faunce set spurs to his charger and galloped in pursuit, but Charlotte outrode him. After an hour, she reached the foot of Quarry Hill. On top of the hill, two horsemen waited anxiously. Jimmy Bone turned to his companion. Scarecrow, there's something wrong. Coach should have been here by now. Listen, I hear horses. No, one horse. Let's get to cover. And they retreated into the trees. Up the hill towards them thundered the horse. We'll catch a glimpse of him in that patch of moonlight, whispered the scarecrow. And into the said patch galloped the horse. Jimmy Bone gasped with astonishment. The rider was another scarecrow. I thought so, muttered the real scarecrow. Wait here, my friend. I'll deal with this. Down the steep bank he slithered his horse. Charlotte! Thank God I found you, she sighed, and she told him of Captain Vick's letter. And you came to warn me? Oh, Charlotte. The sad regret in his voice told her that he was ashamed she knew all, but she answered, I love my three heroes equally with all my heart. Clegg, the Scarecrow, and my beloved Dr. Sin. And I love you, Charlotte. Never did I think to regret my past. Oh, God, were I only worthy of you. Let me say the same, my love. Oh, God, that I were worthy of this grand adventurer. And she placed her hand upon his sleeve. Mr. Bone, not understanding the situation, approached down the bank. Not a word of Clegg before him, whispered Dr. Sin, but for the rest he knows all. When Mr. Bone was told who this new scarecrow was, he swept off his hat, saying, Then I'm more than glad I never stole those pearls. <laughs> so you come to warn the scarecrow that something's wrong. But the coach is late, and if he lingers, the tide will turn on Jesson Beach, and we'll endanger the run. The beacon needs to be fired. Aye, said Dr. Sin, but I didn't anticipate this delay and I told the men the scarecrow would light it. Is your presence necessary after the lighting? asked Charlotte. No, they all know what to do. Then I will light the beacon. No, Charlotte, no. The dragoons will never catch sight of me, she whispered. I know the lie of the land, they don't. I'll ride up to the knoll, fire the beacon and then... Wait for me at the walnut tree inn. Say you're on the scarecrow's business, but are you sure that I love you? Oh, yes, yes, you shall see. And turning her horse, she plunged away on the springy turf. As Dr. Sin watched her go, he heard the rumble of wheels of the coach they had awaited. With a great to-do of cracking whips, the guard put on the skids and the coach and horses slowly descended Quarry Hill. And then... A flash of fire and into the patch of moonlight came the masked figure of Jimmy Bone. Stand and deliver! A flash from the guard's blunderbuss, an answering shot from the laughing highwayman, and the guard fell from his seat. Two gentlemen put their heads out of the window. The driver fired a pistol at Mr. Bone. Mr. Bone fired again, 
and the driver fell against the bank. Now, gentlemen, unless you want to be served the same as the guards, cried Bone, unpack them guinea bags quick. The two inmates of the coach went to it with a will, unloading guinea bags to the road and whimpering with fear. When all was unpacked, Mr Bone stood before them. Be off now! And thank God James Bone's limit for murder tonight is two! Stand in the Scarecrow's name, cried a hoarse voice. The Scarecrow! Jimmy Bone cried angrily as Dr Sin rode up. Your game's up, Mr Bone. I have men here to remove the bags of guineas. Still covering Mr Bone with his pistols, he let out three cries of the curlew. Immediately, the coach was surrounded by armed men with blackened faces. In their midst was Captain Thorns and a dragoon lashed round with rope. I've captured your prize, Mr Bone, croaked the scarecrow. Now ride away and up the hill, if you please. He then turned on the two passengers. You two gentlemen will continue to ride on foot, as we have need of the horses. We'll attend to the dead. Quick! Away with you! Two terrified agents, only too glad to escape, took to their heels in the opposite direction to that taken by the highwayman. Directly their footsteps died away, the dead guards sprang to their feet. They had been previously bribed by the highwayman to fire blank powder. The dragoons were bundled unceremoniously into the coach and the doors were closed upon them. Then the party packed guinea bags upon the horses and made their way across the country towards the walnut tree at Aldington. The scarecrow waved to his comrades and plunged down the steep bank. Keeping a sharp lookout ahead, Dr. Sin thundered on until within a mile of the knoll he suddenly pulled Johanna up. For into the sky leapt the red reflection of the beacon. It was a light. She had succeeded. And then the silence of the night was broken by the sound of musket fire. For the first time in his long adventurings, Dr. Sin was smitten with the icy sweat of fear. The letter of warning which Charlotte had spoken of. And then Charlotte dressed as a scarecrow. God, what a fool he had been. In went the spurs to Gehenna's flanks, and the maddened animal leapt forward, goaded into fury by the demon on his back. On reaching the knoll and dismounting, his worst fears were realised, for there, lighted by the flames of the beacon, knelt his faithful Mips, supporting against his knee Charlotte Cobtree. Is she dead? Not yet, my dear doctor. If you could carry me down to Mother Handaway's, she could help us. I am proud they've got me instead of you. Who was it? I saw three flashes as I rode up, explained Mips. I fired with my blunderbuss, which scared them, and they rode off. I am slipping away from you, whispered Charlotte. Take me on your horse. Let us ride through the air. It will revive me. Without knowing how he did it, Dr. Sin found himself with the girl in his arms, riding towards Mother Handaway's on his horse. Faster, beloved, faster, Charlotte cried, and he felt only that she was right and that death could only be beaten by speed. It was Jimmy Bone and Mips who helped Dr. Sin to dismount gently with his precious burden, and they took the horses to the secret stable, bringing back the white pony. The day's doctor carried Charlotte into the cottage and laid her on Mother Handaway's straw-covered bed. The old woman, in great distress, busied herself with stopping the bleeding from the wounds, but the end was certain, and she whispered that there was no hope. It was doubtful whether she would live until her father and Dr. Pepper could be fetched. This is no time to fear for my own liberty, said the highwayman, going to the door. I ride the faster, Mr. Sexton. I'll fetch the squire and the doctor. You somehow get Dr. Sin into his clerical clothes. If he has taken us to Scarecrow, he will hang. These words conveyed no meaning to Dr. Sin, but Charlotte understood and called Mips to her side. She wished to make her sacrifice worthwhile by saving her lover's life. Wake her, Mips whispered hoarsely. She's done it all for you. Why will you not help her? Scarecrow! Captain Clegg! 
Now a look of queer recognition came into Sin's eyes and he turned to Mips. She loves you, Captain Clegg. We cannot save her, but at least you can comfort her by doing what she asks. What does she ask? That you will dress as the parson for the end. Mips led his master to the underground stable and helped him change from the scarecrow back to the parson and soon the vicar of Dimchurch was kneeling beside the dying girl. Mips sat outside the cottage. It was not long before he was joined by the old woman saying that the end was very near. She's telling him of her love, she whispered, but he is staring like a man possessed. I think his reason has left him. Presently, a distant crackle of musket fire broke the stillness, and the words, Death to the Scarecrow, echoed across the marsh. The dragoons are attacking the smugglers, said the old woman. No cause to worry, mother. It's the men with the white armlets who are pretending to attack the smugglers. A mighty shout of death to the scarecrow sounded from the hills as Colonel Truebridge and his dragoons charged down the marsh road. With all the noise, they did not hear the three horsemen galloping towards the cottage. Mips sprang forward to hold the reins of the horses ridden by the squire and Dr Pepper. Gentlemen, cried the highwayman, it is here we part. I shall not forget that you ran this risk for my daughter, Mr Bone, said the squire, going into the cottage. Get into the stable quick, Jimmy, whispered Mips. When the squire stood and looked down at his daughter... She smiled at him sadly. Forgive me, and remember that the Scarecrow only rode to save the necks of our marshmen. Since she was covered by the old woman's shawl, the significance of this speech was lost upon the squire. You will look after the doctor, father, she went on. The shock of what I have done has stunned him. I have not worn his pearls for long. I should like to keep them with me, but that would be silly. If he recovers, promise not to mention that I am the Scarecrow. You are the Scarecrow? repeated the bewildered squire. For answer, she moved the shawl and showed her black rags. You, Charlotte? My daughter? That information need go no further, sir. The squire turned and met the gaze of a very dishevelled Captain Fonce. I think we're all your daughter's good friends here, and although she has outwitted me tonight, I bear her no resentment. Above all, there must be no scandal. She's paid a heavy enough price for her adventuring. The squire did not answer, for Charlotte uttered a heart-rending sigh. With one hand she drew Dr. Sin's head down to her breast, then with a smile she closed her eyes. Dr. Pepper bent towards the girl. Captain Fawns has spoken the truth. She has paid the price in full. In order that Colonel Truebridge should not discover the tragedy, Captain Fawns went with the squire to cut the soldiers off at the bridge. Mips followed. Well, cried the perspiring colonel, we've rid the mass of the rascals this time. With the help of Dr. Sin's volunteers, we've taken more than 50 prisoners. We don't know yet if the scarecrows amongst them, as the villains were taken and put under the pump at the walnut tree. Under the pump, sir? asked Captain Fawns. In order to identify them. Their faces are all tarred, but I suspect we'll discover some worthy citizens under their disguises. How many troopers are guarding them, sir? Devil take it, sir, not one. I wasn't sparing a fighting officer when we had Dr. Sin's capital fellows. Besides, they can identify the prisoners. Why, there's Dr. Sin. I must ride over and congratulate him. I beg you will postpone it, said the squire. The vicar is about to give religious consolations to a sick woman. Here comes the ones to congratulate, sir, said Mipps, pointing up the road to where the Upton brothers were approaching. Well, I have to say, them boys don't look too happy. The three horsemen, with their white armlets, pulled up wearily. Why couldn't you ride back when you heard the firing? 
Monty Upton demanded angrily. "'What firing?' asked the Colonel. "'What firing?' repeated the eldest Upton. "'Why, up at the walnut tree. You tell him, Tom, I feel sick for an old business.' The youngest Upton moved his horse forward. "'Well, we made the smugglers stack the barrels in the stable yard. "'We then put them one by one under the pump, "'and every man we cleaned we found was a foreigner from Sussex. "'Not a marsh man amongst them, thank God. "'And then, from every bit of cover, "'muskets began to blaze over our heads. Two hundred smugglers, if there was one. "'They freed the prisoners and shut us up in the stable yard "'after they carried off every keg under our noses.' What? cried the colonel. At that moment, round the bend of the marsh road came five horsemen all wearing armlets. There's a second fleet putting in below Dungeness, cried the leader. And they say the scarecrow himself is there. Give Captain Fawns a horse, cried the excited colonel. We'll have him yet. Come along, lads. Death to the scarecrow. The cry was taken up by the troopers as Captain Fawns mounted a spare horse and off they galloped. The squire turned and walked back to the cottage. Then the Uptons smiled. Mips winked. And now, what's the truth? All of it, more or less, laughed Monty. There's two thousand guineas worth of kegs just landed. But we'll see they're all safely stowed before the dragoons get there. Death to the scarecrow! laughed his brothers as they rode away. Death of the scarecrow is what they ought to say, muttered Mips. He went back to the cottage and, producing a tool from his pocket, wrenched off an ill-fitting shutter and carried it inside. It's a long walk to the village, Mips, said the squire. I wish our highwayman hadn't ridden off. His strength would have been welcome. Mips looked at Dr. Sin who stood dazed and forgotten. The vicar's no good, sir. Not just now. But perhaps a sensible highwayman would not ride far tonight. If I finds him, would you go bail for his safety? I'd go bail for his safety with my honour. Give me a minute, sir. Mips left the cottage and in three minutes returned with the highwayman. Both he and the squire exchanged bows as the highwayman said, I'm at your daughter's service, sir. But they were reckoning without Dr. Sin. He no sooner saw that Dr. Pepper and the highwayman were about to lift Charlotte from the bed to the shutter than he pushed them away. Then he knelt down and, putting his arms around the girl, lifted her like a baby and stood up, glaring at them all defiantly. The highwayman took Mips aside. Bring his pony and the horses. He will do it himself, and please God it may save his reason. We'll hide the white pony between us. A few minutes later, the old woman watched them ride over the little bridge. The squire on Charlotte's Mount rode first, for, as he said, who would dare question him on Romney Marsh? Then came Mr. Bone on Jehenna. On his right, Dr. Sin, clasping his precious burden, sat on the white pony, while on his other side Mr. Mipps rode the highwayman's horse. Behind was the physician. So was Charlotte Cobtree brought secretly back to the courthouse and laid in her room. The housekeeper was pledged to silence, and a tale of Charlotte's accidental death was spread through the house. Dr. Sin carried the body to the room himself and sat beside the bed, from which no one could move him. To the end of his life, Mips would always maintain that the three days before and after the funeral of Charlotte Cobtree were the worst of his adventurous career. To persuade Dr. Sin from the death chamber was impossible. He sat upright by the bed, one hand reverently laid upon the dead clasped ones. After the ceremony, he went back to the vicarage. As soon as the doors were shut, the doctor turned on Mips sharply. Brandy! And just stand staring. Brandy, I tell you! 
He gulped down the brandy, and then, taking an old sea cloak from behind the door, he wrapped himself in it and lay down upon the floor, the bottle beside him. In a few seconds he was asleep. Mips was wondering what to do when there was a disturbance outside. As he looked out, he saw a crowd of children at the garden gate, and in their midst towered the gigantic figure of a North American Indian bedecked in war paint and feathers. Crimes! If it ain't Shishuga! Shishuga had much to tell. While trading with Captain Vicosa on behalf of his tribe, he met with Colonel Delacourt and realised he was the man whom Dr. Sin had sworn to kill. He discovered more. They were journeying to England. Shishuga, having taken solemn blood brotherhood with Sin, followed. When Mips, in his turn, explained all the circumstances that had led Dr. Sin into his present condition, Shishuga helped him carry the unconscious man to his bed. After a careful examination, the Indian took a sharp, pointed knife from his belt. You ain't going to scalp him. The Indian shook his head. I shall remove a fragment of the bone above the brain. You can trust me. It was thus that I saved my own father. Leave me. Mips looked at the unconscious man, took a pull from the brandy bottle, and crept out of the room. When the door opened again and the Indian beckoned him, Dr. Sin lay on the bed as though dead. Have you done him in? asked the terrified sexton. He will sleep the sun round. I have given him a drug. By then we will have ready a stimulant to restore him. Revenge. I am going to Rye to trail Colonel Delacourt. On the third evening Shishuga returned. Dr. Sin was sitting up drinking some hot soup. Ah, Shashuga, my blood brother, he said, showing no surprise. With infinite patience, the Indian brought back to the doctor's memory all that he had learned from Mips, finishing with the death of Charlotte Cobtree. Then he declared that he knew who had fired the fatal shots, that Colonel Delacourt, none other than Nicholas Tappet, was threatening to cut the throat of a certain James Bone, who, he declared, had bungled a good business. At this information, Dr. Sin tried to spring out of the bed, but Mips held him back. You'll not escape us this time, sir. I've put old Gloomy, the preventative officer, upon his track. Aye, answered the Indian. That little man stares at him and follows him wherever he goes. He thinks he's a scarecrow said Mips. I hinted as much. But there was a knock on the front door. Mips went down and let in Meg Clowder, who had a strange tale to tell. She'd been dragged from her bed by her husband, Captain Vic, and taken to the bar parlour, where, to her horror, she saw Mary. Captain Vic told her that he was passing her over to his friend. When Meg had cried out against this, Captain Vic had struck at her, but overbalancing, had fallen against the table, striking his head. Mary, thinking him dead, had run from the house. But he's not dead. He's drunk. What am I to do? My poor child. And do you love this man still? I hate him, sir. He's trampled on all I held sacred. He's even given my cellars to the slaughtermen. And the smell of blood brings swarms of cockroaches to the parlour at night. You will stay here tonight, Meg, said Dr. Sin. We'll visit Captain Vic. Captain Vic is the man who nearly betrayed you, my brother, said Shishuga. You remember the red-headed planter? Dr. Sin nodded. I suspected it was the same. Half an hour later, the three men made their way to the tavern. Mary had gone. Captain Vic, in the light of two candles, lay on the floor upon his back, his mouth wide open, snoring disgustingly in his sleep. A few cockroaches scuttled back to their safety hole. Poor Meg, Dr. Sin muttered. Get me a pickle cork, Mips, if Meg has such a thing. Mips opened the cupboard and found the jar in question. What's the bottle marked poison? asked the vicar. 
A little concoction I made up for her to get rid of cockroaches. Sin nodded. Excellent. But first we must make our enemy secure. Knives here? The Indian handed him a knife and the doctor cut the webbing from the underside of one of the chairs. Mips dived into his pockets and a hammer and fistful of nails were laid on the table. Coffin nails, he announced. Somewhat prophetic, said Sin, smiling grimly. He spread the webbing over the drunkard's arms and legs and nailed it to the floor. Then, taking the cork from the onion jar, Sin pushed it into his victim's open mouth. The captain opened his eyes. Ah, Captain Vic, it's a long time since we met, but now I am going to hand you over to an enemy. Mips, pass me that jar of molasses from the shelf there. Dr. Sin took the molasses jar and poured a thin trail of the sticky syrup from the hole into which the cockroaches had disappeared. The trail led across the floor to the pinned-down monster and up his red beard and into the open mouth. Your bestial body, Captain Vic, makes an admirable beetle trap. Your death will be regarded as the hand of God. Now, gentlemen, we will sit upon the table and wait. Goodbye, Captain Vic. May God have mercy on your soul. Dr. Sin blew out the candles. The only noise was the ticking of the Dutch clock upon the wall. Presently, a strangled gurgle broke into the darkness. But twice did the big gilt hand go round the clock before Sin lit the candles. The three watchers gazed in horror at their work of vengeance. The red beard was alive with crawling bodies. Dr. Sin drew in his breath. He has had enough. We must end it. He told Mips to get the poison bottle. Pour half down his throat and the rest on the floor. The sexton grinned and tilted up the bottle. Captain Vic shuddered. The great body strained against the webbing and then the mad eyes glazed. Dr. Sin gave a grim smile. There are yet two more to die. Mary and Friend Nicholas. In the darkness by the churchyard wall, Dr. Sin suddenly stood still. Across the churchyard, a dark shadow of a man could be seen in the moonlight. Dr. Sin sprang forward, but Mips grabbed his arms. There's another man here. Keep your voice down, sir. He's digging. Look, it's Miss Charlotte's grave. I'll lay a guinea it's merry after them pearls that are buried with her. By God, I'll kill him. Sin broke free and ran forward. Mips was right. It was Mary, crouched over a spade. Down upon him dropped Dr. Sin. He wrenched the spade away and drove it at the thief's forehead. Don't kill him here, sir. It's sacrilege. I will not pollute her sweet grave, replied Sin. It was a struggle getting the unconscious Mary back to the vicarage but at last they dropped him on the study floor. Shushuga then rejoined them with a strange story to tell. He had gone across the churchyard and found Colonel Delacourt's horse tethered to a tree. He had followed the tracks and seen the man crouched in the bushes near the front of the vicarage. He has a pistol aiming at the door. He's waiting for me, replied Sin grimly. Well, he'll have his shot. A few minutes later, Merry opened his eyes, groaning. What's happening? I'll tell you, replied Sin. I went and found you about to prize open Miss Cobtree's coffin, to steal the pearls, I presume. I seized you, and to save you from your enemies, I knocked you senseless, and with the sexton's help I dragged you here to safety. Safety? Aye, safety. Just as I got you here, they arrived, a score of armed men, horrified at your deed. Miss Cobtree was much beloved. They'll tear me limb from limb, cried the horrified Mary. I'm a man of peace, Mr. Mary. Show me that you repent, 
and I will show you the path to safety. How can I show you? Who fired the three shots that killed the Scarecrow? The law can't touch us for that. Death to the Scarecrow was the order. It was Colonel Delacourt who lies at the Mermaid Inn, his red-bearded friend who married Meg and me. They said you were the Scarecrow. Then you believed them, eh? I did. But when you appeared at Miss Cobtree's funeral, we got a fright, I tell you. And now there's a rumour going round that she was the Scarecrow. Well, it is quite true that you killed that lovely girl. So it seems to me that it would only be justice were I to hand you over to your enemies outside. But you said you'd save me, pleaded the frightened Mary. Mips, get my cloak and hat. If Mary wears them, he could leave here in safety. The sexton quickly appreciated the situation and helped Mary to dress. The disguise, they all declared, was perfect. Thank you, muttered Mary. It is my duty, sir, replied Sin coldly. Go. As Mary closed the front door behind him, Dr. Sin took three glasses from the cupboard and a bottle of brandy. He filled the glasses with a steady hand, then he picked up one as though in toast. Suddenly, from outside, there came a cry and the crack of a pistol fired. A dull moan, then a second shot. And then Dr. Sin signed to the others, who picked up their glasses to toast. Perfect safety, Sin's salvation. The day broke. The preventative officer rode hard for Rye with a warrant for the arrest of Colonel Delacourt. By noon, exciting horrors of that night were being discussed in every tavern across the marsh, and news soon spread to Sussex and was told by postboys at the Mermaid Inn. Colonel Delacourt sat in the bar. He listened to the villagers whispering and he caught the name Dr. Sin. Who is this Dr. Sin? he asked. You better ask him, sir, said a yokel. He pointed to a man who had just entered the bar. The colonel had been irritated by this man for days. He had a habit of staring at him. The landlord had said that he was the preventative officer from Dimchurch, and he was staring at him now. Go and drink with me, officer, ordered Colonel Delacourt. Never a drink on duty, sir. On duty, are you? Yet you're a far cry from Dimchurch. I was there early this morning, though. But you see, the man I followed last night doubled on his tracks, went to Dimchurch, then came back to Rye. He turned to the door and called, Come in, lads. The colonel saw three men enter. They were the Rye constables. You were asking just now about Dr. Sin, I believe, continued the preventative officer. Well, I'll tell you something about him. He raised the Dimchurch men against the smugglers. Death to the Scarecrow was his motto. Well, what happened? The Scarecrow beat him. But not content with that, he vows revenge on Dr. Sin. He and a rogue called Mary go to Dimchurch and break open the grave of our squire's unfortunate daughter. She was accidentally killed the night of the Great Run. Rumour has it the doctor was very attached to the young lady, interrupted the landlord. Get on with the yarn, ordered the colonel. Well, they quarrelled for they left a blood-stained spade behind them. The Scarecrow must have chased after Mary and lost him. And then who does he see? Why, Dr. Sin himself. The Scarecrow fires to kill. And he does kill. And then he mounts his horse and rides away. Did you see all this? asked the Colonel. The officer shook his head. But I heard the shots, and I saw the body of the murdered man. Then, as I examines the body... I hear the voice of Dr. Sin. His ghost, utters the landlord. No, sir, himself it was. The scarecrow had shot the wrong man. It was certainly the doctor's clothes, but the corpse was merry, dressed up in them. Then Dr. Sin is alive, whispered the colonel. And kicking, thundered the officer. But Mary's dead. 
and that's why we're here, me and the constables. I want you, Mr Scarecrow, for running contraband, but these here constables want you for murder. It's a black lie, roared the colonel, gripping his sword. Now then, come quiet, ordered the preventative officer, drawing his cutlass and advancing. With a rasp of steel, the long sword was out. The officer leapt like a bulldog, but the colonel's sword passed straight through him. Down came three truncheons on the colonel's head as the customs officer crashed to the floor. Mibs had filled in the desecrated grave. Dr. Sin stood above it, wrapped in thoughts of devotion, when Mibs crept up and told him what had happened at the Mermaid Inn. Dr. Sin turned, Get the crutches that we lend to crippled parishioners, then order the squire's coach. He's away at Lim Castle. Crutches, Vicar? I must carry two swords, the ones from my chest, to Rye Jail. I'll strap them to the crutches and hide them under my cloak. Colonel Delacourt must never appear in court. I must kill him in a fair fight, in his cell. Oh, crimes, Captain. It's dangerous. Trust me, I've not lost my cunning. Shall I come too? Yes. At sunset, the squire's coach arrived at the Mermaid Inn and Dr. Sin was welcomed by the landlord. I was about to send a postboy to Dimchurch, Reverend Sir. Since Colonel Delacourt's arrest, his lady's done nothing but ask for you. She's sinking rapidly. The doctor's given up all hope. Many years ago I knew her, replied Sin. Indeed, I come to visit her wretched husband. I will write to the mayor for permission to enter the jail, and then I will see the lady. And not long after, Dr. Sin found himself alone with the woman who had been his bride. At the sight of her beautiful, sad face, all the bitterness of the years vanished, and he felt nothing but sorrow for the dying woman. Imogen? It is I, Christopher Sin. Ah, Christopher. Yes, it is really you. I've always known that we would meet at the last. Her voice was feeble, and he had to lean close to catch her whisperings. It was a strange tale, the story of her life from when she had run away with her seducer. When her boy was born, she knew... He was her husband's, but she deceived her lover into thinking he was his. But he was yours, Christopher, and as he grew he looked like you. Nicholas at last suspected, and he took a hatred for the boy as he had hated you. I had two other children, girls. They both died. One had black fever in Charleston at the age of four, the other died at birth. She was born in a convent, for we had no money then, and it was there that your son, our son, Christopher, disappeared. Nicholas swears the boy ran off with some friendly Indians, but we never heard of him again. She told her husband many things about the boy, and he learnt that Nicholas became cruel because his children did not live. I think this little girl that was born here will live, but I shall not. And what will happen to the poor mite now? Dr. Sin pledged his word that he would look after the child, which comforted the mother. For some time she dwelt upon the old days, but she was fading. Raise me, Christopher. Do you forgive me? Can you? I can and do, he answered. Then she sighed and went to her last sleep in his arms. Half an hour later, Dr. Sin, armed with the mayor's permit and followed by Mips, accompanied the turnkey to the town lockup. He's the only prisoner, and he's a quarrelsome brute, said the turnkey, but I'll watch you don't harm you. 
I'll keep the grid open. The door shut behind him, and Dr. Sin was alone with his enemy. Good evening, Black Nick. At this point, the grid slammed closed. Mips had dealt with the turnkey, and Dr. Sin would be undisturbed. So, it's our parson pirate smuggler, eh? sneered Tappet. Where have you sprung from to jeer at me? From the Mermaid Inn. So, been kissing your wife, eh? She died in my arms within this hour, Nicholas Tappet. Well, God rest her soul. She was a beautiful girl when I took her from you, but plaguy irritating. God rest her soul indeed, said Sin. But let us dispense with prayers, for we have very little time in which to settle scores. But how? laughed Tappet. There's no plank to walk. We shall fight fair as in our pirate days. Fight fair? With no weapons? Besides, you're on crutches. But perhaps you've bought pistols unto that saintly garb. Listen, Nicholas Tappet. During those long years through which I trailed you, my one ambition was to meet you blade to blade, and our blades can meet, even though they will be cramped for space. Choose your sword. Sin whipped the crutches from beneath his coat and showed the swords. By God, Captain Clegg, you were ever an ingenious rogue, I'll say that for you. Choose. Nicholas Tappet drew a naked blade from the bindings round one crutch. Dr. Sin drew the other and laid the crutches on the table. It's a cramped fight we shall have of it, growled the prisoner. But better than a hanging, Colonel Delacourt, sneered Sin, sliding his blade against that of his adversary. The table was between them as they fenced, each seeking an opening, but they were both experts. One would gain six or seven inches, then the other, but for a long time neither of their backs touched the wall. At last the prisoner let out a strangled sob. It was partly due to his bursting lungs and partly to his rage at not being able to break through the other's guard. Dr. Sin answered with a short laugh which stung Tappet to the quick. He seized one of the crutches with his left hand and hurled it against his opponent's legs which brought Sin down on one knee, but the foul was his undoing. As Sin's knee dropped to the floor, so his left hand closed upon the foot of the other crutch. Up went his blade at the same time, and only just in time, for Tappet's sword shot within an inch of his neck. The scooped head of the crutch caught Tappet's neck like a collar and pinned him against the wall. Tappet's sword dropped from his hand while Sin's sword pricked his ribs. Don't move, hissed Sin. I have something to say to you. Tappet couldn't move. If I push my sword home, you will die a gentleman's death, Black Nick. Otherwise, you will die on the scaffold for killing the customer's man. Your pirate name, Black Nick, describes you well, for your soul is as black as your beard, but you have one redeeming quality, and that I will trade with you. You love your child, the baby girl of the Mermaid Inn. Have you considered what will happen to her? Both parents dead? The daughter of a murderer? She would have no chance unless you give it to her in one last generous gesture. You know me well, Nicholas. Even when I was Clegg, you will own I kept faith according to the rules. Therefore you may safely trust my word. Here is the bargain. I will be your child's guardian. I will educate her. I will see that she has a happy life as though she were my daughter. Should my son, of whose existence I only heard today, fail to make his claim to me, I will leave her all my wealth, which is considerable. But for this, there is your gesture to be made in payment. You will go to the scaffold, Nicholas Tappet, alias Colonel Delacourt, as Captain Clegg. Nicholas Tappet could not move even to nod his head, 
but he closed his eyes, which Sin accepted as assent. The crutch was released, and the sword was lowered. You agree, then? Christopher Sin, I've hated you as few men have hated one another, but I grudgingly admit that I can trust your word. Your damned black cloth will be protection for my little Imogen. Yes, I named her after your wife who loved me as you named your pilot ship. But I will trust my girl to you. Tell me what to do, and I will hang as you. You will sign a confession, replied Sin. When that is read out in court, there will be no doubt that you are Captain Clegg. Despite your crimes, you'll be admired. It will be a great occasion, your hanging. By the God I have never believed in, you are, I think, the devil himself, replied the prisoner. So, Clegg died, alias Colonel Delacourt, and despite the pleadings of the Dean of the Peculiars upon the scaffold itself, Clegg died hard, blasphemous, and unrepentant. Fine show, taking it all round, said Mipps on the way back from the hanging. But it made me sick to see the vanity of that there Nick. I think he thought he'd done all Clegg's exploits himself. The most fortunate thing for me, Mipps, that he did. For now Clegg is hanged for good, and the past is not likely to trouble us. Strange how some folks thought Colonel Delacour was the scarecrow. Mind you, some still think it's old Jimmy Bone. Some even whispers that it was Miss Charlotte. Such rumours must be stopped, Mips. We'll ride now by way of Jehanna and have a word with Mother Handaway. Do you want to say hello to the old horse, then? I'd like to warn the old woman in good time. Warn her? What about? Why, the scarecrow will ride again with the next full moon. <laughs> 